Out there. <laughs> I actually told you. Forgot she did it. Ram Ram's killing the chat. What is up, beautiful people? Welcome to Learn How to Trade, formerly known as the Midday Show. That is your girl, Adara. I am Sharif. We're gonna wait for some people to come in here. We're gonna do our shout outs like we typically do we because we have to, outs. yeah. Cause we gotta, we gotta wait for everybody migrate over from the other stream, from the Big Kahuna stream into the learning stream, baby. Shout out to Ramin in the chat. She's <laughs> killing it already in the chat. She knows about the five second rule. I'm assuming that has something to do with food. Yeah, Robot, Alex David, Beatrice Rumford, Sec Growth, Rich Naples, Bob Dub, uh, Patrick, MM, lots of people rolling in the chat. Thank you everybody for coming in. Audrian's art waving hi. I'll oh yeah. Back. Callum Mitchell, hello from Scotland. Hello from Canada, Callum. Yeah. Um, yeah, lots of people. I'm um, hopefully excited to, to learn kind of along with us Love here. It. Uh, yeah, exciting times. Eloy, I like that I name. I love that name. Wasn't that from the movie Gremlins, or was that a different type of movie? There was something no, called like an no Eloy, Gremlins. and Eloy was like a sinister character of, of sorts. Sinister Maybe figure. people can uh, fact check me there in the chat. All right, we got to get some business to take care of. Guys, we are brought to you by Search Trader, account funding of up to $1 million. Keep up to 90% of the profits. Enjoy relaxed trading rules with an 8% max trailing drawdown on all new accounts. Shout out to the good folks there at Search Trader, who by the way, still have or are extending their trading contest from November into December. Top prize of a thousand smackaroos cash and uh, you get to audition with uh, $100,000 of fake money. Uh, prove that you can actually uh, be profitable in the sim uh, before you ever use real money. One of the, uh, one of the adages I like to, uh, I like to yeah. you know, champion. Yeah, I just yeah. gotta update uh, the topics manager here. Uh, otherwise, Ram Ram will, uh, will get really upset about this. So I'm gonna send it to you for a second. Okay, yeah, for sure. Um, so I can talk about the thing I am the most excited about today. Here it is. Here we are. I'm waiting for the Cybertruck launch. Um, I've had it up all morning, even though I know it's not till three because I want to trade a little bit of Tesla. Um, I think my strategy going in today, in addition to like all of the teaching and learning, is basically I, I find the last couple of days I've been a little less scalpy than I'd like, and I have a tendency to kind of, um, you know, lately just stay in trades a bit longer than I would normally. So yeah, we're gonna try to do some scalping and we're gonna keep an eye on the Cybertrucks driving into the market there. Adam, I see you, Adam. I see you. Six nil Arsenal group winners. Uh, we get a free game next time, so we'll probably play our second team. Just doing a little housekeeping here, some footy. Uh, obviously Dallas plays tonight, so I'll have more to say about that one tomorrow. But let's get to the first topic, guys, uh, we're gonna continue with our theme of the week, which is moving average-based indicators, okay? And the first one we've got, there the Katina man is pumped about that. Uh, the first one we've got on deck for you is moving average envelopes. Now, one of the first things that I said when we started talking about moving averages on Monday is they are very poor during consolidative markets. Many false signals, okay? so. When we're typically in a consolidative market, and we'll talk about how to identify that a little bit later, we want to switch from using moving averages into oscillators, and we will be getting to the oscillators topic in the coming weeks. But there is a little bit of a way that we can kind of still em uh, employ moving averages during consolidative periods, and that is by using the moving average envelopes. Let's look at what moving average envelopes are. Right, let's bring up AAPL here on the daily chart. This is Apple's daily chart. Let me just put that in. And as you'll see, we have three trend lines, each with a different color. The bottom one being teal, trust the teal. Shout out to Max, who apparently is on vacation again. Um, really? But yeah, well, his computer has been empty. I'll have to talk to the Kenobi one, find out where he's at. Uh, the red line is the moving average. There is the Kenobi. Look, G Kenobi, give, give, give the people <laughs> what they want, like bro. Give the people what they want. <laughs> He's, He's so decided not to. Anticlimactic, <laughs> my goodness, eh? Um, the red line over here is the actual moving average being employed, and then that's the top straddling line. Let's talk about what moving average envelopes are, okay? What is a moving average envelope? They are a popular trading tool, great. Unfortunately, they are prone to give, moving averages in general are a popular trading tool, but they are prone to giving false signals, especially in choppy or consolidated markets. So how do we get around that? 
by applying an envelope to the moving average, some of these whipsaws, and whipsaws means, you know, when you get wicked in or wicked out of a position prematurely because of a consolidative market, some of these whipsaw trades can be avoided and traders can increase their profits. Envelopes trading has been a favorite tool among technical analysts for years and incorporating the technique using moving averages makes for a useful combination. So let's understand what moving average envelopes are. To limit the number of whipsaw trades, some technicians proposed adding a filter to the moving average. It's not exactly a filter, but you'll see in a second. They added lines where a certain amount uh, above and below the moving average to form envelopes. And that's what we're looking at here. So I want you to understand the middle line here, the red line, is the actual moving average. And then the above and below line are basically straddling moving averages that you dictate uh, how far away they are. And we'll get to that part in a sec, okay? Trades would only be taken when prices move through these filtered lines. In, in this case right here, if they break the teal, you would go short. If they break the purple, you would go long, okay. now, right? And the whole point is, is to not rely on the red line because you are worried about these uh, whipsaws during consolidative markets, okay? I see, okay. So trades would only be taken when prices move through these filtered lines, which are called envelopes because they enveloped the original Ooh. moving line, <laughs> moving average line. The strategy of placing the line 5%, 5% above and below the moving average to form an envelope is illustrated on this chart as you can see here. Now, the way that I am able to uh, adjust for that is I go into my, um, my study setting here in my platform and then I have my, my uh, envelope, it's under ETB, okay? And then what I have here is this variance. First of all, I have the period. So what moving average am I using? Number one, is it a simple moving average or an exponential? That's your first choice right there. So I've chosen EMA. You guys know how I feel about the exponential for day trading. Number two, you're choosing the actual moving average itself, not the envelope, the actual moving average. In this case, it's a nine, but you know, it, I don't typically ever use the nine. So let's go ahead here with something that I do use, which is, well, we'll just leave it at nine for now, okay? And then the variance, this is the percentage so that I put 5%. You can set this to any percentage you want. And this basically has to do with trial and error. You can adopt what other people have used and attest uh, what others have attested to as uh, you know, effective and accurate, or you can do your own trial and error and see what variance percentage works best for your trading style. It, but the point is to understand that this variable right here, variance, is the 5% that um, we're talking about right now. Okay, in theory, moving average envelopes work by not showing the buy or sell signal until the trend is established, right? Analysts reason that requiring a close above 5% of the moving average before going long should prevent the rapid whipsaw trades that are prone to losses, especially when you're using moving averages again in a consolidated market. Moving averages can be quite effective on their own without envelopes during trending markets. The problem is, you know, find, identifying the trend can be a bit tricky because sometimes you think you're in a trend, but you're really within a, you know, a longer term range. When you look at the weekly, perhaps, or you look at the daily, you may, you may be you know, kind of fooled into thinking, well, we're in an uptrend right now. But when you look back a bit further, you'll notice you really haven't broken through that top, the, that maybe a high that was touched three times that hasn't been breached yet. So sometimes it's tricky to, uh, to find out or to, or to establish whether you're in a trending or a consolidated market. The drawback of envelopes, before we try to actually uh, use them here, in practice, what they did was raise the whipsaw line, right? So if your whipsaw line was the actual red line, which is the moving average itself. So if you were to say, okay, Anytime Apple's price breaks this red line, I'm Gonzino. Well, you probably got whipsawed umpteen times anywhere in this uptrend. However, if you were using this teal line, trust the teal, as Max says, you didn't get whipsawed at all. Okay, so that's what in practice they're supposed to prevent. 
Another drawback, how it, sorry, in practice, what they did was raise the whipsaw line. As it turned out, there were just as many whipsaws, said one study, but they just occurred at different price levels. Another drawback to using envelopes in this way is that it delays the entry on winning trades and gives back more profits on losing trades. So clearly, if I'm waiting for an uptrend to take place, I'm gonna have to wait till it breaches and breaks and closes above the purple line before taking a long. That could basically leave a lot of money on the table. I could be leaving a lot, uh, you know, left there, lost profits because of the delayed entry. So that's one issue, one, two issues that we have with moving average envelopes. There is a way though to make these moving average envelopes work a little bit better. The goal of using moving averages or moving average envelopes is to identify a trend, trend, trend change. Often the trends are large enough to offset losses incurred by the whipsaw trade, which makes this a useful trading tool for those willing to accept low percentage of profitable trades. So the whole point here is that you're going to have multiple entries, multiple, um, most of them are which are gonna be whipsaw trades, but they're gonna be very small losses. But if you allow yourself and the discipline to allow it to run when it's actually successful, you should be able to make money on the net. However, astute observers noticed another use for envelopes. In the chart here, I wanna show this chart over here. Um, how do I do that? There we go. We'll zoom in over here like this. Um, actually, you know what? Allow me a second. I think I have it on another screen, or do I? Yes, I do. Yes, I do. Give me one sec. Which one is it? Um, da -ba -ba -ba. Drawbacks, yes. Mate, there we go. Okay, open image in new tab. There we go. This one over here. Let's zoom in, and let me zoom it on the other one. In this chart, we show a weekly uh, the weekly chart for Starbucks with a 20-week moving average, and the envelopes are set to 20%, not five, 20% above and below the moving average. Most of the time, when the price touches the envelope line, prices reverse, but there are times when they continue trending and leading losses. So as you can see here, when you set it far away, right, you're less likely to get a false signal. But the problem is with setting it far away is that you leave more money on the table, okay? So what's the point here? Sorry, most of the time when prices touch these envelope lines, prices reverse, but there are times when they continue trending leading to losses. Yeah, so in this particular case, if you were, um, you know, in this particular case, if you were looking here for a bounce off the top line or the bottom line, pardon me, and you didn't get that breakdown and you sold when it touched this line over here, it ended up making a bit of a move back up. So there are times where it's going to be a little bit tricky. So before we go on and actually try to use it in the wild, any questions? Oh, I have questions. Okay. Yeah. So um, basically, from what I understand, it's kind of, uh, I guess to make sure that you have stronger confirmation of a trend break before you get in? Is that kind of its purpose? Yeah, so okay. the whole point, number one, to use these is to try to employ moving averages during times of consolidation. Because okay. you're not supposed to use moving averages as buy or sell signals yeah, during consolidation. Because then it can get, like you can get mixed signals exactly. and we'll buy or sell too early. You'll have okay. so many false entries and exits, right? Okay, cool, right? okay. So the point is to try to use the upper band and the lower, and I didn't want to call them bands because we use those for Bollinger, Bollinger bands, right? I want to use the word envelope, the, the enveloped lines, the enveloping lines on the top as indicators of when the trend may be shifting or may be continuing. So okay. that's the whole point of using these bad boys over here. Okay. So moving average envelopes allows you to kind of uh, use these in a trending market. Okay, and then yeah, if it breaks up above, then that's a buy signal. If it breaks below, it is a sell signal. Mm -hmm. Okay, very Blackberry cool. asking, so these envelopes are quite similar to the use of Bollinger Bands for exit and entry. Similar in the sense that you have, um, you know, a band from the upper side and the band from the lower side, and then you have the middle moving average. In the Bollinger Bands, it's an SMA. In this case, I'm getting to use EMA. The calculation on Bollinger Bands is a little bit different though, okay? And the calculation on Bollinger Bands has to do with a completely different set of factors than the one that we're using, talk, we're, we're using for uh, moving average envelopes. Moving average envelopes allows you, number one, to select 
the moving or the exponential or simple. That's number one. Number two, you get to select the duration of the moving average. Are we going to use 20? Are we going to use 50? And number three, it allows you to set the percentages above and below uh, where you want the enveloping lines to be. And you know, a lot of this is going to have to do with trial and error. A lot of it is going to have to do with the time frame on which you're trading. Are you trading on the daily? Are you trading intraday? Uh, again, I've never employed these on an intraday trading style. And to be quite honest, I've never employed them on a swing uh, trade as well, like with the, other, um, with the other indicators that we were talking about earlier in the week. I told you I don't use them intraday, but I often use them for swing trades. This one, I don't use. Okay, I've never used, and I'm kind of learning along with you guys here. I'm having to prep for all this, and so it's refreshing a lot of stuff that I've read. So moving average envelopes, Adara. Okay, I also noticed something earlier too in the chat that I um, I want to address now too. I Before. forget who was asking. Someone was asking what's the difference between EMA and SMA, and why you use EMA. And as far as I can understand, you know, we were talking about this yeah. moving average day, which I believe was Monday. Yes, EMA, uh, because it, exponential moving average, sorry, it basically it calculates, it puts more weight, it weights more heavily the more recent price action. Yes. Right. So that. Hopefully, the moving average that it results in will be a little bit more tailored towards more recent movement as mm -hmm. opposed to just an average of the general price. Exactly. Movement. So it should be a little bit more accurate. That being said, though, still lagging indicators, which I guess leads yes. me to a question. These are still lagging then? Always. Of course. Yeah, yeah. They're always. Moving averages, by definition, are taking historical price action and giving you an average for it, right? Okay. So okay. the moving averages, guys, again, to calculate the simple moving average, very simple you're taking the closing prints for a specified duration. If you're trading on the 14-day simple moving average, it's 14 days worth of data. You take the closing print of all those, you add them up together, and then you divide by 14, all right? And then you get that dot plot on there. Now, when you move on to the next day, you take the most recent 14, so you drop that 15th day, that initial day, that gets dropped, and you keep taking the newer day and combining and adding all those closing prints and divided by, dividing by 14. The exponential moving average more heavily weights the, the most recent days, like Adair was saying very ex exactly, right? And therefore, you get a more heavier weight on the recent price action as opposed to day one and day two, which are far removed from where we are at the moment. So moving average envelopes, guys, very similar to some of the other ones that we were talking about. Um, but the mathematical calculation for them is a little bit different, and it allows you to use moving averages in consolidated markets. That's what you need to know about that. Aaron and Joanna Brewster, uh, you were referencing the movie Time Machine, the creatures named Eloy and Morlocks. Yes, there thank you. Can I tell you that I have never even watched that movie? The only reason really? I even know the reference is the Big Bang Theory. They talk about it in the Big Bang. You know how I love the Big Bang Theory. I always forget that you do love the Big Bang Theory. Yeah, I don't know why. Did you watch Young Sheldon then or no? I always watch Young Sheldon, oh, okay, yeah. So you watch I love it. Okay. I love it's how it's a prequel. Yeah. You know what yeah. I mean? But I, cool. there's a big difference in the character. Like, well, well obviously. He was like a kid. Well, right? yeah, but yeah. that kid plays it in a completely different way. I like him, though. He's really good. And I like to see the mom. And the dad is not so much of a drunk in uh, Young Sheldon as it's oh, yeah, made he's out to be. They make him seem like yes. he is one. In, uh, he's supposed to be like this drunk and who like shoots raccoons and stuff like that yeah. when he gets uh, when he gets a little tips, you know? But, That's cool. Yeah. That's cool. Yeah, it's I a little different. Yeah, I think they had to make it a bit more PG. Um, yes, uh, I know. I know. I'm. A, I'm such a nerd. Joe Werner's like such a nerd. I am. <laughs> I'm the biggest nerd, bro. Uh, trust me about that. All right, uh, Ruba Shah. Shah, you should use several indicators when you trade. I like to stack the box in the sense I like for multiple indicators to give the same signal before I buy and sell. That's something we've talked about. I like to stack the box. Too. Yeah, yeah. And that's a nice little expression. But that's something that we've been talking about. We've been talking about not relying too heavily on one indicator and looking for confluence between the multiple indicators that you use. And the more indicators that point to the same direction or result, obviously, the better. You're looking for confirmatory signals. Okay? Yeah. That's what we're doing there. All right, so moving average envelopes, guys, quite easy to understand, a lot different using in practice. Sadly, I don't have experience to tell you how I personally have used them since I don't, but this is something that may interest you, especially if you're uh, much more inclined to use moving averages than maybe oscillators or anything else. D-Loaf, 1450 GME break. 
No volume below. Watch out. The Katina man is in an absolute print factory over there. He just spun the money. Uh, I'm in no trade at the moment. I'm keeping my eye on this 15.9, but I feel like we're going to break below because we're doing the dance with no pants here at 15.9, but it's just... It's too anemic. The Katina Man says Tesla's about to break. So, yeah, I got to agree with him. I don't really see much in the way of a long here on any of the futures, but I'm not going to make that as a blanket statement. I'll continue to watch, see if we make a higher high. We rejected at 15.925, which, surprise, surprise, was the previous support level support coming in as resistance here on the Fuge NQ December contract. 15 more days for this bad boy to... Uh, for this contract before we roll over. This is what I'm talking about over here. Look at there. Ooh. Trough, yeah. clear support, and then support becomes resistance oh, yeah. again. Don't okay. you it's love so cool. that? Oh, that? That's a really cool, um, yeah. I've been kind of keeping my eye on that now too for myself. Because, yeah, um, yeah no, you're right. It's like a really, it's, it's a good, interesting. Yeah. it's a good um, technical look. Yeah, it's like system, literally yeah. like one of the most, um, I think, I would say most, most accurate. accurate, yeah, technical uh, signals, support and resistance. Okay. And that's what the big kahunas use. They're not all about this. Uh, you know, indicator lifestyle, you know, that's the just the way style. they trade, right? Yeah. Um, all right, guys, put the questions in the chat for moving averages, I mean, uh, moving average envelopes before we move on to the four-week rule. The four-week rule is a hell of a rule. It's super simple, but very effective. And this, I, my first exposure to the four-week rule was with, you guessed it, John J. Murphy's book, The Fundam uh, Technical Analysis of the Financial Markets. He makes it very clear in there. And you know, it's been stuck in my mind ever since, and something that I actually employ when looking at daily charts. Any questions from your side about moving average? Uh, moving average envelope, no. So I think, yeah, my main one was just kind of confirming, I guess, that idea of the, um, the break of the channel. And I'm guessing also, if we have the channel break, with more volume than we also do have. Always. We have more support. Okay. Always. Um, yeah, okay. I think that would, those would be kind of my main my main things then because I think this one I understand okay. a little bit better than some of the ones yesterday. Like I think, you know, it's very much within, as long as it's kind of within the range. Yeah. It's, it's a fair let's one. play around with this one though, okay? So here, let's go to the chart over here. Now we have the nine. So the red line here is the nine, but I mean, I don't care for the nine. So let's go ahead and use the, let's use the 50, okay? Because, well, we know what I, how I feel about the 50. We're going to use the 50 and click apply, OK. And all of a sudden, uh, you know, uh, things are a little bit different over here. So this one is going to be the 50. Let's change the indicator thickness. There we go. Why did it change the colors on me there? I mean, I don't get that. I didn't ask for the colors to change. Uh, the <laughs> Why are you in the bag? That's what the colors are doing. Right? Yeah. Um, yeah, so this one would be the 50 period moving average. And look how all of a sudden it's a little bit different, right? Oh. Yeah. So here, I mean, I'd have to play around with this, but this is super interesting. So in periods of um, a trend, the envelope doesn't work that well. Look how it's straddling the upper 5% line. That doesn't make a whole lot of sense. But look how in consolidative market, it seems to actually hold the bottom line much better, which is interesting because you don't want to use moving average envelopes in a trending market. You just m use moving averages in a yeah. trending market. You don't need to use the envelope. And when we did get a little consolidative over here, that's when it seemed to shine a little bit, where even when we had the uh, lower highs, like this was the, uh, the August high, the late July high, and then that was the early September, and then that was the mid-October. Remember, we kept calling it October. You would have not gotten a, a bad signal to buy on any of these crests. And then finally, you got the proper signal in the November to remember, right? When we actually broke through there uh, on day 10. Again, by definition, you're going to leave money on the table because this is delaying the buy and the sell signal. So, you know, you, you can, you, I know what people are going to say in the chat. Well, Sharif, bro, I mean, Apple was at a, a 167 and a half on um, the last day of October and early November. You'd be missing almost $20 worth of range. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Uh, but the, the other side of that coin is I wouldn't have been cut up in early September or mid-October getting in at these highs because none of them breached the red channel. So this is very interesting to see that it doesn't work well during trending markets, but it actually works pretty well here during consolidated markets. I have to do more work on uh, this, obviously, but we'll have, a, we'll have a look at that a little bit. Uh, let's just look in the chat here. Anything uh, that's being asked? Uh, 
modern news. When Katina Man says no volume below 1450, does that mean no buy or sell? No, I mean just low volume, brother. Uh, there's always going to be volume of uh, one sort or another. Uh, Joe Werner says, why I really don't like that indicator. I don't, I don't know if he's talking about the, the moving average envelope, but yeah, yeah, you're, uh, you're entitled to that. Uh, the Boring Man, Sharif, I was stuck at 188 Apple when I bought at the peak and then it plunged to 166, but if you had been using the moving average envelope, you wouldn't, right? Because look at this peak over here. Come to the chart. Is it Ram Ram or is it uh, the Chilean nightmare? Or it's uh, Ram Ram. Um, this is, I'm assuming, what you're talking about over here. You bought at the high, but you didn't buy through the break of the red envelope. Or, yeah, the red line on top, which is the top envelope. And that's the beautiful thing about this indicator during consolidative markets. I'm really going to actually have a look at this uh, more thoroughly. This is very interesting. Um, why isn't that showing properly, bro? There we go. Now we're good. All right. Victor Hoffman. Are the periods in the settings based on interval you are looking at or days? Both. You have two things here. You have a, three variables, Victor, okay? Let's go back to it. The first, the first variable is whether you're using exponential or simple. Second variable, the period. What type of moving average? The seven day, the nine day, the 20 day, the 50 day. You get to choose that. And then three, the variance. The percentage above and below the main moving average line that you want the envelope moving average lines to be. And in this case, the standard use is 5%. My suggestion to you is though, don't take that at face value. Do some trial and error there and figure out what works best for your trading style. Anything uh, to add, anything to say? Yeah, I mean, I think someone's, someone's asking here too, yeah. um, Brian, is there any indicators that don't give lagging info? They all kind of do by nature of, of yeah. what they are. But yeah, like we were saying, uh, find what works best for you. And also sometimes you can combine indicators as we were saying. Absolutely. Uh, and or even the other thing we, that came up a lot during chart pattern week last week is sometimes like look for things in other time frames to give confirmatory signals, yep. right? So if you see pattern in one time frame, maybe check another time frame. Are you, how is VWAP doing? Are we near any significant point right. of resistance, resistance sorry, or support? Yeah. So look kind of for confirmation there. Um, also, I will address um, a trade that made me raise my eyebrows at myself. Go for it. Because that's what we're here for, to learn and grow and Damn. not do things like what I did here. Um, which was, so Eli <laughs> Lilly, I was trying to short, I was waiting for a second candle to the downside. We were down here and then we flew to the upside. This one, literally, I got swept away in this. I got out basically the second I was kind of noticing we, we flew up here. Um, why I got in was because, again, we were noticing like a top here, some wicks to the upside that weren't getting fulfilled. Alas, I got in too early. DC in the chat, shout out to DC saying, try again at triple top. Thank you so much for the advice there. I'm going to wait and see on this just because I don't want to get swept up yet again. I, I've had some success with Eli Lilly lately, though. I think I've just been struggling a little bit with this guy because it will, it will move very slowly and then all at once. Uh, much like, you know, how poets say you fall asleep. Um, but yeah, not, not my bestie right now. Also, um, Tesla, just keeping an eye on this as we skirt uh, or flirt with or whatever. Skirt. The 240 area, skirt. Um, but yeah, so, so here is um, Tesla. Also, I have a question about Tesla. Yeah, Would this yeah. be a head and shoulders, like a little tiny bit Ooh, head and shoulders? Ooh, let me have a look on my chart. Go that is my... my I can't what tell. What time frame are you looking at I'm there? looking at the five. The five. Okay, I'm looking at the daily. My bad. Come to the chart chart, Ram Ram. Um, what is purpose. going on over here? This is distorted because of the, uh, yeah, let's move that bad boy Yeah, off. I'm not like fully confident that go. it is, but I think it, like, do you see what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, have, and it's uh, preceded yeah, by? By movement to the downside because the head and shoulder is a continuation. No, path. Oh, sorry, that's the thing. That's what I want to point out to you though, okay. right? Remember, it is a reversal pattern. Yeah, I said that. I started yeah. saying that, and I was like, this I knew you wrong. knew. I know you yeah. know. I know you know. Um, uh, look, it's not a hard and fast rule. Again, that's the true. ascending wedge on the auto. That's what I want you yeah, to remember. The that's descending what, wedge. Because it descending. was descending. Yeah, exactly. That's true. But it was followed by not a move down. It was no, followed move by a move up. up right. So yeah, Leoto was breaking all the rules there. Freaking Leoto, it's down again. Um, yeah, but that's a good look, Adira. I mean, uh, I see what you're seeing there. No question about it. It's just if you want to stick to the hard and fast rule, you need an uptrend. You need an uptrend. Yeah. Okay, thank you so much. I appreciate no that. Um, I'm going to keep an eye on this with regards to, and I'm going to bring it down one more time, cyber truck season. Um, here we are. Three hours mm -hmm. and 29 minutes left. Uh, yeah, 
Perfect. So yeah, we're gonna. I'm also gonna talk about a trade that I had earlier that actually went well. And as we're looking at it now, we might say I could have stayed in. I would say I should have stayed in. But like I said, I've been having more success the scalpier I am generally, and I've been kind of moving away from my scalping related. Um, preference the last couple days didn't have as much success we got roughly 50 cents on this little baby meta scalp here and then if had I stayed in we would be about three dollars in the money alas we did not we're not here to have regrets um, scalper in the chat yeah I mean I, I am a scalper I, I, I've said that very freely but yeah I mean I should have you know maybe I should have stayed in longer but like I said I think part of it you have to go comfortable you have to be comfortable with what you're doing at the time right at this time I was comfortable kind of getting my 50 cents um, maybe I should have stayed, but yeah, keeping an eye on all these mega caps. Google also making um, a beauteous move to the downside. Um, so I will pull up Google. Yeah, Google is just gorgeous here. My one issue is like I always said, I have trouble shorting at lows of day or near lows of day and getting long at highs of day because there's always a chance you could get reversed and you could get, it could get swept out from under your feet. Um, if I see like kind of this movement up and the opportunity to get, what are, what's the opposite of a dip, I guess, for a short? a little baby, a baby high, then I will go in off of that. Um, I'm kind of liking this move to the downside though. Google has had one, two, three, four, five green candles to the upside on the five minute. That is horrifying. Um, so yeah, Google still looks like a decent short. Um, yeah, keeping an eye on some things. Finch Dane in the chat, Tesla gone wild today. Indeed. Um, yeah, there you go. Uh, Super SPAC man, thank you. Good call on Meta. Yeah, I. Thank you. I mean, maybe I should have, you know, I'm not going to have regrets. Right now we're kind of moving back to the upside on Meta, so we might get some little baby scalp longs in here. Um, there we go. Yeah, this 323 area, we'll see how we hold up around 323. Could be an interesting area for Mr. Meta. Um, what else is happening? DC, my first time succeeding in shorting Tesla. Congrats to you, sir. Are you guys good to go over there? No? Okay, perfect, never mind, sorry. Okay, sorry, no, but no worries, sorry about that. Um, let me look, uh, someone in the chat here, who was the Zion Lala, think NVIDIA has lower lows to downtrend today? Let's look at NVIDIA. I've been keeping an eye on NVIDIA, nothing to, um, to kind of trade yet. Um, here we are. Yeah, NVIDIA, okay, so um, lower low, lower low. Yes, yeah, so we did have this low that was slightly higher, but we did make another lower low since that, so to answer your question, Zion Lala, I would say um, it generally looks like a downtrend. Um, I'd like to see kind of this 460, what is this, 467? See how we do here. But yeah, until we make, I would say until we make a higher high, to me personally, looks like NVIDIA is having a nice downward channel. Shout out to what we were talking about last week. Um, yeah, there we go. So yeah, Tesla's still kind of moving down. I also had my eye on Disney. Uh, Disney, lots of news. We had the Trian. Um, drama with some Nelson Peltz and Disney saying that they will not be offering them a board seat. Uh, they basically papooed their um, interest in being on that board. We also had with Disney um, the news with uh, Twitter with basically Elon Musk making his comments and then all his fans uh, mass posting on X like, oh, we're not going to um, be subscribing to Disney Plus anymore. So yeah, keep an eye on Disney. Um, kind of chopping and churning right now. I'm not going to do much here and it's not doing much right now either. Um, yeah, I don't know. Let's, what else do I have on my list here? You guys good? No, sorry, sorry, sorry. Um, crowd, okay, CrowdStrike I'm looking at here too. This is, this is day two earnings now. Um, sort of a flat bottom, lower highs. We could be having um, a bit of a um, flat bottom break uh, situation perhaps. Downward um, descending wedge. Just gonna keep an eye on this one there right now. What are the, the other earnings plays? Like from today, we have CRM moving right now. Okay, yeah, CRM is interesting. We do have the move downside. We're still very positive on the day. Um, yeah, I, again, I like to kind of have a better sense of, of general move. If we continue to be a short, this 246.50 area could be of interest. I'm going to keep my eyes peeled. My ears peeled, whatever, just keep an eye on CRM. And then Snowflake as well, another one to watch perfectly. Okay, um, so uh, right now I'm gonna pass you over to the big desk where we have an interview. 
No, almost done. Okay, sorry, never mind. I'm so sorry. Uh, my apologies there. Um, <laughs> Snowflake, kind of interesting. Um, we had this kind of downward movement after this double top, kind of right at open, 191, moved down. Um, then we got to like 158, kind of moved to the high side. Now we're kind of trending lower again. So we have both a downward channel and then maybe like an attempt at an upside play. Yeah, this is my, this is my um, little earnings, um, I guess my little earnings bubble here. Snow, CRM. We had CrowdStrike yesterday. Let's look at Foot Locker also from yesterday. I am not going to turn my nose up at a day two earnings play. Netflix had like five or six days worth of earnings plays. You know what I mean? So, um, so no worries here. Yeah, slightly lower highs. Okay, perfect. Sorry for all of the um, confusion there for everyone in the chat. Uh, now we are time to go with the interview um, with Jeff and Sharif. All right, guys, we got Jeff Mendel here, head of broker dealer sales at OTC. Marcus, Jeff, well, and Cowboys fan extraordinaire. How can I forget that? Welcome, Jeff. Hello, Cowboys. Yeah. Good to be here, Sharif. How's everything? How was the flight in? Uh, it wasn't that bad. It came in this morning, uh, a little bit of snow on the ground uh, when we landed, but, uh, you know, I guess it's that time of year. It but, is, um, man. I mean, if, it, if you're lucky not to get snow right now, I mean, they'll usually we kick the can down the road. When do they usually get snow in New York? Uh, we've had some already. Already? So, okay. So from where I'm from, over the Adirondacks, there's there's a, a good coating on the ground already. So I don't feel uh, that bad then. Know. Okay, good. Well, we're, you know, we're all in the well northeast of the U.S. and you guys being on, you know, in the east coast of, uh, of Canada, right? We expect it this time of year. Oh, for so. sure. For yeah. sure. Um, what are you looking at today, Jeff? What do we got? Well, first of all, I just want to say I'm looking out at this studio right now, and every time I come up here, there's something new and cool, like this camera that's right here. Like, every time I come up here, I, I remember back when it was just a little round table, and we were all kind of sitting around it with a little webcam, and now you're <laughs> up over, what, 450,000 subscribers? Yeah. We're almost there. We're like, knocking on the door. pretty awesome, man. Yeah, I just have to say. And I wasn't, it wasn't even that long ago. It was probably, like, only five years ago, so... I just I have to say that to the the crew here. It's and, growing, it's yeah. growing, and it's it's because of our viewers that we're growing, right? So, and we got great guests like yourself as well coming in, letting us know about uh, what's moving in the markets. Jeff covers the over-the-counter market, OTC. All our viewers, well, our regular viewers, will be familiar with Jeff. We've got lots to talk about today. We have GBTC, as you remember, guys. We're looking for that spot Bitcoin ETF to be coming into play anytime. And there's been a lot of volatility in the crypto markets right now, Jeff. Yeah, so obviously, uh, you know, we'll start off with GBTC, right? Uh, top of the most active today, like it, it is on many days. But um, there's definitely a lot of turnover in this name right now. Like you saw ARC, uh, you saw ARC the other day. They, they got out of, uh, I think, a, a few million dollars worth of the name, right? And so uh, going to be a lot of turnover, inflows and, and outflows on this on this name, right? And so obviously that leads to a lot of trading opportunities, uh, you know, and obviously, you know, when you're day trading or if you just want to be a part of the moves in crypto, uh, definitely a great name to look at. And it's going to continue. Uh, this is definitely going to continue until it becomes an ETF or if it becomes an ETF. So um, that and uh, GBTC and then also have to say ETHE. Um, along the same line. I don't want to put you on the spot here, but when GBTC, if it does, if it does become uh, from a commodity, or sorry, from an equity to an ETF, what's the process that we typically go through? How does that roll over for people that are holding on to so, it? Okay, so, yeah. so, so basically what's going to happen is, you know, right now, uh, Grayscale, I think it's already submitted uh, a filing yep. to, to convert it over to an ETF, right? And so Grayscale already has everything in place to do that. Uh, and then it, what will happen is it'll ultimately, it'll go up to, I think, uh, maybe Arca, which okay. is uh, the listed, yep. uh, the listed uh, exchange. So goes up there. Um, you know, I, th I think from um, you know a standpoint of trading. You know, I mean, obviously it's very liquid down here. It's going to continue to be the same thing once it goes up, or right. if it goes up to the up to the exchange. Um, so you know, definitely something to kind of keep an eye on. And um, you know, it's 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 I guess it's fun to trade right now. Oh, yeah. And. and uh, and you just, uh, yeah, keep going. If you could come to the chart, guys, I just want to show, guys, GBTC, guys. We started out this summer there uh, at around that $13 area. And as you can see, it has been higher highs and higher lows. We're now knocking the door of 3150 We made that high not that long ago. So uh, several hundred percent of the high side already this year, Jeff. Mm -hmm. 
Yes. And so, you know, like if we're also looking at this uh, most active page, right, we have a bunch of other names here, uh, like the five, the five letter uh, uh, shares that end in Y. So those are all ADRs. Got it. I heard uh, Sean was talking about Volkswagen a little bit yesterday. I don't mm -hmm. know if you want to pull that up. Uh, there it is. Maybe, Maybe that means he was trading it a little bit, but I think it's what it's V W A G Y. So Volkswagen, uh, it trades on uh, the Frankfurt Exchange, uh, right? That's the that's the local, but also the ADR uh, trades uh, here on on, uh, on OTC markets. So what uh, what time frame is that chart there? That's a daily. So you know, obviously a decent amount of movement right there, but a great example of a company that's you know it's. It's known around the globe, you um, and you know if you want to uh, continue trading, you know if you, if you're over in Europe and you want to continue trading, uh, you know on on U.S. hours, it's a great way to do it. Or also, it's just if you're here in the U.S., a, a great way to uh, to trade it, also own it uh, as, as well too. And so you know you see that up there with uh, some of these other most active names, and you know it's a lot of uh, you know like what we like to uh, what we like to take a look at here because. OTC markets, I think over 90% of the actual volume that's right. traded on a notional basis is in these international, internationally listed um, companies. And so. Absolutely. Yeah. I got a good quick uh, question myself for you, Jeff. Um, I like BYD. I think it's one of the better Chinese EVs out there. I think it's a real company, whereas some of these other ones are just startups. You got two of these on your exchange. You have BYDDY and BYDDF, and I've never really been understand the difference between Y and F. Can you shed some light? Uh, so that's a great question. So uh, let's start with BYDDY. So sure. BYDDY is set up as an ADR. Okay. And so that means that there is a bank that um, that comes in typically and, and sponsors it. I'm talking about ADRs in general, right? right? So typically a bank comes in, sponsors it, and they package it up. And when, so when you're buying it, there's some type of ratio to the local market okay. versus the shares that they have um, in, in the, uh, it's basically a depository receipt, okay. right? And so those are being held at a bank somewhere, you're buying and selling huh. shares. Okay. Um, and so BYDDY is the ADR it's of the ADR. BYD. Okay. And so you can see that up there, it's on the most active page, um, right? I don't even think we need to shoot over yeah. to it. But uh, BYDDF okay. is that, so that's a foreign ordinary share. So that, when you're buying and selling that, you're, you're essentially buying the local share just in a US dollar denominated I see. quote. So a better example of that is actually what goes on between um, uh, the US and Canada. Right. And so in oh. Canada, you'll notice there, there's no Canadian ADRs. Right. Right, so the, there's no five letters ending in Y. Right, that's because there's a setup in the in the settlement process between uh, the DTC and CDS, which is the Canadian uh, depository. Okay, there's there's basically a process in place that allows people to seamlessly and fluidly trade Canadian names in a U.S. dollar denominated quote, and that's the the F share or the foreign the foreign ordinary share. Okay. And so when you know when you're buying and, and selling uh, um, one of those Canadian F shares, we call them. Um, when you're buying and selling one of those, you're 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 buying the local security here right. here in Canada. Very interesting. So that, that's uh, that's basically the biggest uh, the difference between the Y shares and, and the F shares. Clearly, Canadian -ish, uh, um, equities not too much risk behind them in terms of uh, you know not reporting uh, the books in the right way. Any issues with trading the Fs for Chinese stocks? Well, uh, I, I mean, listen, there's, risk in, there's risk in everything, sure. right? I, I didn't mean I, to put you yeah. on No, no, yeah. like I said, I mean, yeah. there, there's, there's risk in, in, in anything that sure. you're trading, right? I mean, that's just the, I think that's the nature of, okay. of, of trading, right? Um, as far as Chinese stocks go versus um, you know, versus, you know, Australian stocks versus right. Nordic stocks versus anywhere in the world, right? I think there's always like some sort of geopolitical risk that goes into that overall equation as well, too. Sure. And so, you know, at the end of the day, right, if a company is, you know, is, is, is filing, um, you know, going through all the disclosures that they need to go, right, they're, they're, going, they're going through some type of process right. that was set up uh, you know, either in the local uh, country that uh, that they list in, or you know, in the U.S. or in Canada or China, right? So there's all there's typically always some type of process. Gotcha. But, you know, it always goes back to um, yes, there's a risk and there's different factors that go into it. I gotcha. What else you got for us, Jeff? 
Oh, I mean, we can we can look at Luck and Coffee right here, which is I know you like that L K N C Y. Right, we already said so. L K N C Y. That I think that was trading on Nasdaq. They had those issues there. It dropped down um, to the over the counter market. It's trading at four dollars right. when it came down. Look at it now. It's all the way up at thirty three dollars, okay. uh, over thirty three dollars. Right. Um, D I D I Y. Love talking about that. I know Sean likes trading it as well too over there so uh, you know just another name um to kind of look at um and like i said we have we have adrs and we have f shares from all around the world quick question now we all experienced the bed bath and beyond and the whole debacle that happened with the bankruptcy and the moving down from the nasdaq into the otc markets what's that process like so that process right uh it's so it's all driven by corporate actions got it and so there's some there's a filing Right. And, um, you know, when a company is delisting and coming down to the over the counter marketplace, uh, right, there's uh, there's a, a delisting notice that goes out there. Everyone gets it at the same time. Right. Um, you know, typically, you know, there's some type of press release, but it all gets posted at the same time. And when that happens, you know, from, you know, from the, the forward look, at, you know, from the from the outside, what you see is you see that delisting process and you see that it's going to be trading typically under a new ticker or sometimes the same ticker. And so, you know, in, in, in your trading account, you log in or in your um, you know, investment account, you log in and you see that either the new ticker or the same ticker. Right. Right. But what we do on our end is we prep that or well, we don't prep, but we we um, get the system ready to allow people. Uh, market makers and, and proprietary trading firms and any type of trading firm, any type right. of any type of Finra broker dealer, got it to start trading that name. Then, ideally, the next day after that delist actually happens, got it. and so that means that there's a seamless process and there's you know hopefully no delay from when you can go from trading that name on Nasdaq or NYSE to then next day trading it uh, uh, over the counter. So it takes some uh, preparatory actions on your part. You kind of have to be anticipating that coming down in order to have everything ready. Yeah. So we yeah. so we have a team that's devoted to to looking uh, to monitoring those corporate actions. Right. It also goes the other direction too. Right. There's there's mm -hmm. plenty of names that also use uh, OTC markets to kind of start out and test the waters on becoming public and becoming you know uh, publicly quoted and, and traded in a in a in a in a right. public secondary market. And then, you know, once they've reached a certain point, then, you know, okay, now, you know, we, we move up, we go to NASDAQ. But then also it goes in reverse, too. We see a lot of regional banks that, see, that, don't, see, that don't see all the benefits or don't need right. or benefits or they just see the benefits of trading over the counter versus trading on an exchange and, you know, the, some of the market structure things that go into it, um, sourcing liquidity in, in, in a slightly different way and the different nuance um, in the over-the-counter market versus the listed side. So, you know, we see it going in both directions. It's not right. just the D-list, right? You know, companies also voluntarily, well, D-list, to right. come down to us and sure. they go on our QX platform or they go on our QB platform. Hey. And so, yeah. Fantastic. All right. Anything uh, else you got for us? Or? Uh, I don't know, but I think the Cowboys are playing the Bills pretty soon here. So uh. Okay, so there's, a, there's something you need to know. So uh, Neil and I are, uh, as good of friends as Neil and I are, we're also quite competitive uh, okay. when it comes to our football teams, as you can imagine, right? So uh, him and I, we've got this uh, standing bet. December 17th, we're at the Bills. Cowboys are at the Bills. If the Cowboys win... Have you ever heard of that Sally Up, Sally Down song? Okay. Bring Sally up, bring Sally down. It's supposed to be a workout song. You're supposed to do push-ups or squats to it. Every time he says Sally up, you do a squat up. Every time he says Sally down, you do a squat down. We, we were, and we, hold it. You got to hold it on the down. Hold That's important because you're going to be doing right. it. Ooh, you got to wait saying. until he says Sally up to come back up. So, Neil... You know, because the Cowboys are going to win, he's going to be doing a lot of squats <laughs> December 18th. That's that's, that's just cute. a fact. I, I, I think he wants it. Wow, so, so we're getting a little sweat equity involved in this one. Right? I like it. Right? Uh-huh. There we go. First of all, the Bills are going to win, so I won't I won't break a sweat if I do it, but I'm not going to have to because the Bills are going to win. And it doesn't matter that Vaughn Miller was just arrested on a domestic. Uh, we're going to win anyways. <laughs> I, I was just telling Sean, star defensive player is a, just had an arrest warrant 
out for him. Thank you very much, Von Miller. But they're still going to beat the Cowboys. It'll be all in good fun. Wow. Everyone out here is going to enjoy watching both Sharif. And I guess maybe you can videotape yourself doing them, Jeff, because it's a good exercise and you'll enjoy <laughs> doing it. I'm going to have to bring out... Uh like gym clothes that day, especially for that day. But you, you should too, Neil. I, I, I bring, I bring two sets of clothes if I were you, my man. You, if we're doing <laughs> oh, the squats. Oh, it's here not we that, go. It ain't that big the of a deal. The trash talk. I love it. It ain't that big of a deal. It's All easy. All right, guys. Easy. <laughs> Good Light stuff. work. Seventeen. Light guys. work. Uh, Jeff, Hold thanks up. for coming on, brother. Appreciate you uh, being here. And uh, Jeff Mendel, head of broker dealer sales at the OTC Markets. Always love having you on. Thank you, Sharif. Thanks, Jeff. Cool. Yeah, dude, I like I like it, man. Mix it. Um, cough drop. Good times. Netflix. I'm in Netflix currently. We're basically around my point of entry. Nothing too crazy happening here. Thank you so much, ne uh, Sharif and Jeff, for that interview. Um, that was awesome. And yeah, we have to see who wins the bring Sally up, bring Sally down debate because that will be of interest. Yeah, of course. No worries. Um. Yeah, so I can talk about this Netflix trade I'm in. Uh, I got in because we were seeing this um, kind of swoop up. We saw this bottom, this 471.8 area. Then we were kind of were slowly climbing to the upside. And I was like, you know what? Let's get in on this here. I liked where we were going. We did take that candle to the downside, but we're actually holding this 473 area pretty well. Uh, if we see the size to break below 473, perhaps I leave. But for now, I shall stay. Um, we know we're saying like buy, buy the roundy face or by the smiley face, but you know. Um, but it kind of looks like a, you know, a bit more of a V kind of shape, but we're definitely skewing higher, I would say. Sort of an upward channel here. I am not going to think twice. I, you know, I'm down. I am intrigued. I am invested. I am interested. And I am in the trade. We're, we're so close to my point of entry that there's nothing really to worry about yet, but I will keep a level head and an open mind because the market does not care about your feelings. Um, so let's, I also want to reflect back on Lily, which is continuing to the high side. Um, this, this area, 593.50 is really interesting. We continuously see this chop and churn around here. Then we fly to the upside. Right now, it does look like a long. We just broke 596. If I see a dip, I might take, dip my toe in there. Cause that one's interesting. But yeah, for now, my main trade is that, um, Netflix long, bit of a slow burn there. If we can take that one to VWAP, I would be pleased as punch. Um, but yeah, that's my take there. Also meta, I was mentioning maybe scalping meta as a long. And honestly, meta, this bottom at 323 is so enticing to me. It cannot make up its mind. And I love the chop and turn. If we break 323 either direction um, decisively, hello meta. Um, you might not be meh for right now. Um, no, I'm joking. Meta and I are fine. We, we had a little short there earlier today. I have no complaints with regards to Meta. But yeah, right now, I mostly just want to see how that Netflix um, long plays out right now. One of the first longs I've taken in a little bit, actually, because, you know, I've been talking, I've, I've been a little bit more short biased recently. So this has been quite the plot twist. But yeah, I liked the, um, I do like the technicals on Netflix right now. We'll see if I continue to like the technicals on Netflix. But yeah, that's how that one's shaking. Also, Tesla trying to regain a little bit of strength here at this um, 240 area. Uh, if we break this higher high, this um, 241.50, this 242, I might actually jump in because Cybertruck time. And hello, Sharif. Hello, hello. Just had to get back, prep everything because I log in my platform up there. I got to re-log in over here. So sorry about that, guys. But shout out to Jeff. Thanks for coming by. Always explaining things in a very clear and concise way. You know, you guys know the, the question I asked him about BYD. Very important for me because you guys know how I feel about BYD. It's a real deal in terms of a Chinese EV uh, maker. It's transitioning in the way that Ford and GM wish they could transition from ICE engines to battery. They're doing a lot better job at it. Uh, quite frankly, whether whatever, however your feelings about the Chinese market is or Chinese electric vehicles, the fact of the matter is they're pumping out numbers of EVs that are rivaling Teslas. Full disclosure, I'm not in this one. I wish to be, I will be if it comes into a position where it's, uh, it's interesting uh, from uh, a PE perspective, but we're gonna have to wait and see whether that manifests or not. But yeah, shout out to Jeff Mendel. Uh, making uh, things easy to understand for us lay people here who don't really know, understand uh, the OTC markets that well. All right, guys, let's put up the topics board again, baby, because we're ready to go on to the next topic, the four-week rule 
uh, Ram Ram. There we go. She's always on point. And I'm gonna hit next topic. There we go. All right, guys. Oh, it's like this. There we go. All right, guys, the four week rule. Excellent rule. Um, it's obviously more for long term trading slash swing trading. It's not a day trading, intraday, intraday rule. I guess maybe you could adapt it. Let me tell you what it is first, and then you guys tell me whether or not you, uh, you think you can adapt it. All right, four week rule. Trading systems are usually thought of as complex computer programs requiring massive amounts of data to calculate the best entry and exit parameters. But in trading, often the best solution is the simplest. Uh, in fact, one of the best known trading systems doesn't even require a computer, and that's what we're gonna talk about now. So the strategy behind the four week rule is as follows. The weekly rule in its simplest forms form, sorry, buys when prices reach a new four-week high and you sell when prices reach a new four-week low. Let me repeat that. It's quite simple. The four-week rule in its simplest form, you buy the instrument when it reaches a new four-week high and you sell it when it reaches a new four-week low. A new four-week high means that prices have exceeded the highest level they have reached over the past four weeks. So it's obviously a shifting uh, standard. So we start from day one, which would be today. How far back do we look? Four weeks, okay? And as we keep moving for, uh, forward in uh, life, we have to adjust where we're looking at this four-week rule from, okay? So again, a new four-week high means that prices have exceeded the highest levels they have reached over the past four weeks. Likewise, a four week new low means prices are trading lower than they have at any time over the past four weeks. This system means that you are always in the market, whether long or short. It's a continuous system. This is obviously employed by some hedge funds and some larger money, uh, money managers who have to be in the system. Some of them in their charter, they cannot be in cash. Okay, so they have to be constantly deploying money, whether long or short, and this is one of the strategies they use, hence why it's important, okay? Known simply as the four week rule, or 4WR, this is the exact system designed by, can you guess who it's designed by? A person's name that we really like? We used it this week. Was it Donkey? Hey! Yes! Our friend Richard the Donkey Kong man, uh, no kidding, of course. So, uh, Richard Donkian was the inventor of this very simple He really simple is system. the father of trend He's an trend OG, following. Bro. Well, they, they weren't joking when they called him the father of trend following. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he is, straight up. All right, let's continue, guys, because we got more to talk about here. This strategy will constantly be on the right side of all big moves in a market. However, the strategy also has a low percentage of winning trades. The problem is that most markets trend at about a third of the time. So whether up or down, markets are, prob are usually trending about one third of the time. In some markets, the four week rule may be right less than 40% of the times. The other trades are usually small losses though. That's the whole point here, which occur while the market consolidates within a choppy price action. And perhaps because we're worried about, you know, whipsaws in and out during consolidated markets, one of the things that we could use you guessed it, moving average envelopes that we just talked Look about. We'll get that. back to that in a second. All right, using the four-week rule. How do we use this bad boy? As an example of the four-week rule, we can look at Google before it split into class shares in 2014. Let me get you that figure over here. One second, let me pop that up. Here we go. Um, there we go, open image, a new tab. This is Google, or this is Goog actually, before it split uh, back in 2014. This shows a typical winning long trade. When a new four week high was reached, Google was bought. It was sold about 10 weeks later when it made a new four week low. The trade resulted in, you guessed it, an impressive 18% gain. However, there is an issue. The problem with this trade is that it was up by more than 30% at its high and gave back nearly half its profits before giving a sell signal. So we know that we were up about 30% in 
using this four week rule, but we had to actually wait until it you know, came down to 18% gains before we got the sell signal. There's another way to kind of avoid this and that's using moving averages. So we're gonna talk about refining the strategy here. One way to address the problem of staying in a trade too long is to change the exit rules. And how are we gonna do that? Instead of following the original four week rule to exit a position, traders can exit when a moving average is broken. For example, applying a 10 day moving average as the exit criteria. So not using the moving average as the entry criteria, but looking at using a 10 day, I'm not, not uh, advancing here the 10 day as the end all and be all, that's gonna be for you guys to figure out, but applying a 10 day moving average to the exit criteria on Google as shown here, would have increased profits by about 25%. So instead of giving back from 30 to 18% gains, you would have got out here when you went down from 30 to 25, which is something I can stomach uh, a lot more than giving back almost half. A 10 day moving average was selected because it is one half of the entry signal. So what does that mean? Well, four weeks is essentially 20 trading days. That we know because we don't trade on the weekends, right? So that would be half of that. So it would be the 10 day moving average, oh. half of the 20 period. That's why they selected that bad boy. Okay, that's cool. Yeah, but, you can, but any time period shorter than the entry signal can be used. Okay. Okay, and then trend filtering, last topic here on the four week rule. Another use of the four week rule is a trend filter on the overall market. For many traders, it can be a challenge to determine whether the market is bullish or bearish on a short term basis. Applying the four week rule allows traders to objectively define the trend. If you haven't made a four week high, or sorry, a new high within the four weeks, you can kind of gauge the market is consolidating. But if you have, it can kind of give you the idea that no, 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 it's not a consolidated market, we're trending here. If the market's most recent signal under the system is a buy, the trader can be confident that the market is in an uptrend. Downtrends can be defined as times when the latest four week rule signal was a sell. In other words, the market has made a new four week low more recently, more recently than it made a new four week high. Using the four week rule as a filter, the trader can look at, can, sorry, can look for the four week rule to, buy, uh, to be on a buy signal before entering new long positions. Sh short positions would only be entered when the market is on a four week rule sell signal. I hope that helps. It's not something obviously that you can use a four week rule for intraday trading. However, I'm thinking maybe you can kind of switch it to a 40 period rule. Okay. It's not for me to decide how you're gonna, how you're gonna employ it. What I like it for is it helps me understand for day trading, whether we are in a consolidative market. Okay, so it's more for under the trend filtering aspect. There you go. You can for. use it for long-term trading. You can use it for swing trading, okay? But its use for intraday trading would help the person identify generally, generally, not specifically, are we in a uh, trending market or are we in a consolidated market? There are other ways to do that, like we saw with moving average envelopes, okay. right? But this is one good way as well. And could you use that as well for like um, indices or like the NASDAQ or the SPY to kind of get a sense of like how we're, Absolutely. would that give a better sense of the better market at Absolutely. large as well? Absolutely. Okay, cool. Yeah, yeah. I love that. Yeah, uh, there's really no restriction yeah. on the instrument that you can use. That's really cool. I'm yeah. also seeing a, a cool question from Feed oh. Rhymes with AMC. Oh. Does the four week start at the four week high or four week low? It, it starts, starts at the four week now. high, right? Oh, it starts from now? Yeah, so okay, what we cool. start from now, okay, you have to have a start date. Obviously, I like right? That. Okay. And then you're gonna look at what the highest high is within the previous four weeks. Okay. Okay. And then you can start there, or you can start from today, allow the four weeks to develop, and then look at what the highest high is, and use that as a standard for anything that comes after it, the four subsequent weeks. And then you'll be like, okay, well that's a new high, or conversely, the lows. Okay. Cool, thank you. And thank you for your question, Fee Rhymes with AMC in the chat, because it's a good question and it's one that I also, I think, was kind of having. Um, but yeah, no, so it's interesting to see that you can, if you use it for like a wider index like the SPY or the NQ, like the futures, you can maybe even get a better sense of general Absolutely. market trends, no which is, I think, kind it. of a cool application that I just kind of thought of. But yeah, no, this is a new one to me, the four week rule. And yeah, I'm excited to uh, kind of learn a little bit about it and see if we can find any in the wild. Someone was mentioning to me in the chat, I apologize, I don't remember who, mentioning Meta looking at the four week rule. I mean, I haven't really started yet. 
um, with the weeks, so I, it would be a little bit harder. But I can look at like the days and kind of see what we've been what we've been doing on Meta with regards to levels. Because I know I mentioned Meta, kind of. Um, I was I did short Meta earlier. I was considering shorting it again later. I mean, yeah, like Meta definitely kind of coming down here. We did go up to that 342 ish area. We're kind of falling a little bit. So it would be like four weeks. Here's like November. Oh my god, I can't believe it's the end of November. Um, yeah, so I mean, like four week wise, we're not we're we're kind of in the middle on Meta. Um, right. Maybe I misunderstood the question. Yeah, I think it's it, it is interesting though too, knowing you have to start now. So I guess if I were to chart this, I would probably have to start now. But yeah, um, we'll take a look at the weekly chart as well. Thank you, Super Stack Man. Um, I don't have a weekly on here, unfortunately. I only have um, minute, hour, day, month, and year. But yeah, for the the daily, um, I mean, we took like we've taken quite a hit so far today. We'll see how it ends up on Meta. But yeah, I mean, it does look very much like we are, um, we're kind of down in the day. Yeah, I, 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 yeah, I apologize. Um, thank you for the suggestion, Super SPAC man. I wish I did have a weekly so that I could kind of reflect on that better. But yeah, I mean, Meta generally kind of- You kinda, can use TradingView. You don't have TradingView? Could I use, oh, I, yeah, yeah, I have TradingView. You do, yeah, okay. you can use TradingView if you'd like. I'm not gonna, you don't have to do it right now. I'll get to this uh, question okay, while uh, you set up there. Uh, Fry Rai, Sharif. I used the things you taught me yesterday and made a good trade on AMD today. On AMD? Really? Kidding. It's AMD. Uh, today, <laughs> How using, dare they call it AMD? <laughs> using higher lows and VWAP retests. So thank you. You are more than welcome. Uh, the more you print, the happier I am straight up. There's the only reason I'm here, <coughs> pardon me, is to kind of uh, let you know what I'm doing and uh, to make sure that you guys improve. Otherwise, I can just be trading back there, yeah. right, uh, with the rest of the floor. So... Shout out to you on that. Very happy for you, Fry Rye, um, on that. All right, a great guys. Great name, too. It is, Fry right? Rye. We're going to start um, the uh, topics again in a bit. Now let's have a look a little bit at the markets. Uh, first and foremost, I wet my beak here on a couple of trades on this NG, uh, sorry, SNGX, the rocket ship uh, that's up over 180% today. And I see another rocket ship developing here by the name of SM. FL, I'll get to that one in a second. The point of this one here was to take it off key levels. Uh, so I waited until we got down after that big, um, that big, um, uh, what's it called? Halt down, got it at the bottom near uh, support level, wet my beak uh, on a couple of profit takers. It ended up coming back down below my support level, even though I did give it about 10 cents. I got out of that uh, for a small loss punched back in much larger size, and then you can see a boom, a boom goes the dynamite there getting, mul yeah. I was in the halt actually, but uh, oh. it went quite well as we uh, almost knocked on that $2 area, getting my, my best out at that 181. So SNGX, the rocket ship on the day, but the new rocket ship that's coming into fruition right now is this is not Minim. We saw the Katina Man absolutely print on Minim with a $3 plus winner, but the one that's emerging right now as the leader up 189% SMFL. And we don't really need to concern ourselves too much with why this is moving. Like I've mentioned to you guys in the past, these small cap come in bunches, okay? Yeah. As soon as you get a triple digit one, there is a good chance the next day uh, you're gonna have multiple triple digits. And that's exactly what happened. We had BBOS yeah. run up big boy yesterday and lo and behold, we've got three, one, uh, three triple digit ones today. Adair. Yeah, trying to do small caps this morning. It was like you had too many choices. Everything was running off, selling like hotcakes, I guess buying like hotcakes. I don't really know how one says that. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, quite the, quite the week for small caps. It reminds right? me of, um, I think like kind of, uh, it was in, I believe, it was September or October, close to when I started. Tempest was that, that was the one that blew up like 3,000% in a day, and it would not stop running. And it got all its little small cap friends to run with it, right. too. So that was like my first big example of like the small cap bubble, quote unquote. But yeah, this has been really, yeah, an interesting one. Also, um, shout out to Raphael in the chat. The value of the segment of Trader TV provided to our trading community is amazing. Thank you for sharing your knowledge with us. Thank you, Thank um, you for so being. much for the support. I love that. It's so. Very nice. Um, yeah, so yeah, great times. Also, in terms of um, trading currently, um, I know I'm bad. I'm looking at Eli Lilly again because we had that. I was saying to I someone in the chat. Bad. I was saying to someone in the chat, if we break that 593, I am intrigued. We broke 593, so now I'm trying to dip my toe in because if you, it, it's kind of hard to see now with the dark pool wicks. But 593 was like holding for a while, 
And we got up to 596, and I was like, if we break 593, guess who's dipping their toe in? Myself. Um, so yeah, like so, it. pardon? I like it. Thank you. Um, I, I just got into out. an SMLFL trade here. It's probably going to end very soon. Just took out 30 pennies right there, and we're going to get out break even for the rest. This is not one that I really studied, but I did like this level over here. Former area of resistance acting as an area of support. I was just a little late to the party here. Should have been in at this at around four and a third, maybe four and a quarter. But I wet my beak nicely there for a nice winner, and I'm in and I'm out super quick. And, you know, with these SMLFL ones, you guys see me holding the trade like all three hours yeah. okay and that's with these big cappers but quite frankly these small cap gappers like I know Sean held his for a long time today but I would say that that's the exception not the rule with these ones because they're so volatile um, personally it, what the experienced traders that I've seen trade these and trade them with success they're not in for that long they're in large size for a 20 30 percent move and then they get out um, it just because it's so hard to predict what the hell they're going to do. They're so easy to manipulate because they're short float and anybody with a big account, multiple traders on this floor could do it, could manipulate it one way or another. So hmm. wanted to share that one quick. Thank you for the nice comments though. Uh, DC says the market is basing. Uh, yeah, you're not wrong. It's th the thing is, I was looking at that 15.9 as an interesting area where that we could hold resistance. Um, but the problem is with that theory is that we've been making lower highs and lower lows. So even when I thought over here, okay, look, great, we got down into 15, uh, eight and three quarters, we're gonna start popping back up. Sure, we popped back up, we got right back into resistance, but then look, we made a lower high and then we trended down, lo and behold, we made another lower low. So the trend to the downside on the NQ and on the MAG7 names is still intact. It's a downtrend until you break and hold above that key previous high, okay? It's not that complicated. You can draw channels to the upside and the downside to see that it is a downward channel. Guys, lower highs, lower lows. Higher highs, higher lows. Rarely will it steer you wrong. I'm not saying it's 100% accurate, but keep your eye on the higher highs, higher lows, lower highs, lower lows, especially in day trading. I, I feel it's quite effective. All right, let's circle back, Adara, uh, to Ram Ram, if you could, please. Uh, moving average envelopes, and I'm gonna let you take it over there. Yeah, time. let's talk about it. So Go. moving average envelope, MA envelope, what have you, popular trading tool, but unfortunately they are prone to giving false signals in choppy markets, as we kind of talked about, right? I'll like it is mine up here. Real, a little bit difficult there. So by applying an envelope to the moving average, some of the whipsaw, whipsaw <laughs> trades can be avoided, and traders can increase their profits, which is always nice. Um, envelope trading has been a favorite tool among technical analysts for years, and incorporating that technique with MA makes a useful combination. So basically, how does it work? So basically, in order to limit the amount of whipsaw trades, some technicians proposed adding a filter to the moving average. Um, they added lines that were a certain amount above or below the um, moving average to form envelopes. So you got your MA in the middle, and then you have um, a line above and below. And traders would only be taking prices when the price moved beneath, with, uh, be above or below the filter line, right? Um, so if you if you move above, then there's a sign, you know, you could go long here. We've broken the, the channel to the upside. If it goes down, oh, we can go short. It broke the channel to the downside. You know what I mean? So that's kind of how, how that generally works. And then traders would only be taking um, trades when the prices move between the filter lines. And they're called M envelopes because they envelope, they encase the original moving average line. Encase. Um, the strategy of placing the lines 5% above or below the moving average to form an envelope is illustrated here. Um, yeah, so in theory, the, the moving average envelopes, they, work, they don't work just because they show the buy or sell, um, or they, yeah, they work by not showing the buy or sell signal before the, uh, until the trend is established. Um, so you literally will not show a trend until we break above or below, right? Um, analysts kind of reasoned that requiring a close of 5% above the moving average before going long should prevent the rapid whipsaw trades that are prone to losses. So basically it's the whole idea of waiting for confirmation but of this trend break before you get hop into the trend. Um, but some of, yeah, so drawbacks of envelopes. In practice, basically what they did was they just raised the whipsaw, whipsaw line 
As it turned out, there were just as many whipsaws, but they occur at different price levels. So another drawback to using envelopes in this way is that it delays the entry on winning trades and gives back more profits on losing trades. So like a lot of these, especially with indicators being lagging, you do have obvious, like always going to be that risk, right? Of you don't get into a trade until it's a bit too late, especially if you're waiting for 5%. So once you get into the trade, you know, maybe the movement has kind of already died off, right? So there are, there are risks as there are with all trading, as there are with all indicators. That's why we're always kind of saying, you know, it's nice to have some confirmation. Confluence, shout out to OB, kind of having, um, you know, multiple um, indicators working for you so that you can always triple check the movement. Uh, and basically how to make envelopes work better yet. The, the goal of moving averages or moving average envelopes is to identify trend changes, right? Um, so often the trends are large enough to offset the losses incurred by whipsaw whip trades, which makes this a useful trading tool for those willing to accept a low percentage of profitable trades. That's the thing though, right? Because you have to wait for it to work. Absolutely. So it can take a skosh longer. Um, but yeah, like astute market observers can notice another use for the envelopes. So. Um, you know, you can kind of see um, when the price touches the envelope line that prices can reverse. Um, there are sometimes when they continue to trend leading to losses. So it really, like, you can kind of try to preempt reversals, mm -hmm. but it's also going to be a little difficult to do. Uh, it requires a lot of patience, much like a lot of what we were talking about yesterday yep. as well. You've just got to be patient, wait, uh, much like, you know, the, the FIBs, Yep. Uh, Fibonacci sequences, a lot of it is just patience. And if, if you know, pe different people have different indicators that work for them. Um, so that is kind of the um, the MA envelopes in a nutshell. Packaged, signed, sealed, and delivered. There you, you go. I like it. Um, I'm going to add a couple of things to that. But first, a uh, fry rice, Sharif. I use the lower high and low, lower lows today, but I was wondering how you can use that to know when to hold your position or sell them. So your trade is no – okay, so if you're taking something long, okay, and you got it uh, wherever, it makes a higher high and a higher low, you know you're in the right spot. But if it makes a lower low, then you know the trade is no longer valid. Um, let me see if there is a, maybe there's one that I can show you here. I think Softy probably would be a good uh, example. You saw the Katina man in this one today. So for example, say for whatever reason, I was inclined to get long at that 377 and a half trough right over here on Softy, okay? And I take it for a decent winner. I take 377 and a half. It pops up into 30, 379 and a half. And I think I'm in a $2 banger. And I start dusting my shoulder off. And then, you know, I like I, that. right? And then I take, I take about half the position off. All right? I'm, I'm still holding half the position. Look what it does. It comes back down. Look what it does, though. It makes a lower low. If it breaks this level here, off which I got in, and it makes a new lower trough, the trade is no longer valid. You need the trend to continue. That includes higher highs and higher lows if you're long. If you get a newer low, that's it, okay? That is it. Now, the point is to not trade on a small enough time frame like the one or the three where you can get full signals. So the trick here is to find your sweet spot. For me, it's the five. That's how I, that's my optimal viewing. You can use the 10. OB likes the 15, for example. There's no hard and fast rule about determining highs and lows, higher highs and higher lows, pardon me, right? But the point is to make sure that it's a standard that you use constantly so that when you go back, you review your data, it's the same type of data. It's not some five minute, some 10 minute, some 15 minute, and you have skewed data and you can't extract anything out of it worth anything. So first rule is, if you're getting in on a low and it prints a new low, that is it. You made a newer low. The, the, the trade is no longer valid. And the opposite is obviously true for those who are shorting. If you're getting at a high and you get in a higher high, that's it. The trade is invalid and you got to get out. That's not advice, of course. It's how I trade. Do a, make of that what you will. I wanted to add to Adara's um, analysis, uh, which was very uh, on point there for the moving average envelopes. This is Boeing. Now we are looking at the ah. daily chart on Boeing. Let's type in B-O-E-I-N-G. That good old company that can't seem to get out of its way. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a, it's a tough one. Now, by definition, you are going to miss out on a certain amount of profit by using these uh, envelopes to determine when you get in 
uh, on a long trade or when you get in on a short trade. So for example, look what Boeing did over here. The October lows that really hurt everybody's account, mine included, we got to about 175 bucks here on Boeing. And then you know things started turning around for them like it did with the overall market. Now, if I was waiting for the upper channel, I don't wanna call it channel, the upper envelope, the break and close above the upper envelope to get long, I gave up quite a bit of money, all right? The good thing is about this though, is you get cut up less, but you leave a lot of money on the table. So technically, you could have been in at that 175 and you would be, you'd be $50 in the money because we're up at like 228 today at times. However, if I was to wait for the upper, upper envelope breach to get long, I would be getting long at 205. So I'd be 20 bucks in the money, right? Maybe a bit more, 23 bucks in the money. That's a big difference in being 50 bucks in the money, okay? So there are drawbacks, obviously, to this style, or, or sorry, this um, indicator, this system of trading. Uh, the point is, though, you're supposed to let your winners ride, uh, and if you do so, on average, um, the little paper cuts that you take uh, by wrong signals are supposed to be outweighed by the profits that you make from letting your winners ride. So, you know, again, I, as I stipulated at the top of the show, it is not one that I use. It is one that I'm aware of, but not one that I've employed. I think that it'd be great to show this to you guys so that you guys could use this and see how well it works for you. All right, let's go and uh, see some uh, questions over here about the, uh, bah, 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 the uh, moving average envelopes. Would love to take some questions, guys. Um, you're welcome, Finch Jane. Fry Rye comes back with another thing. Sharif, he says, would you not risk to hold the position even if it broke out a little bit to see if it confirms uh, the reject or to make a new low or would you just put the stop loss at the last high and call it? You could give it a bit of room. Like you don't have to have it at the strict area of that previous low, right? Give it a bit of room, right? I mean, it, obviously the amount of room you give it is entirely dependent upon the instrument that you're trading. If you're trading Tesla, well, we know how volatile Tesla can be. Hmm. It's not going to be two pennies that I give below the, the yeah, previous low. Yeah, it'll be low. a little bit harder. It has to be yeah. a bit more room. You got to give it 50 pennies. I'm not, uh, no advice, of course. You're going to have to gauge Personal that for yourself. Personal comfort, yeah. Right. So uh, you're, you're on to something, Fry, right? Nah, no question about that. The point is, it's again, I'm going to keep saying this over and over because it, more appropriate, it could not be. This is not a science, guys. This is an art and you have to figure out, you know, how you want to draw. You want to be Monet, <laughs> and, or you know, you like want to be somebody you else. You want to be Van Gogh. There you go, baby. You want to be Edvard Munch and scream at the market. <laughs> like, it, you got to stop me. Right. But yeah, I no, I, it, I, I think it also, I think a lot of it too comes down to, again, like we were talking a little bit about, and you know, we have plans for a future week as well, talking about how you pick um, your stocks, right? And I think the more you trade a stock too, the more you become comfortable and you know kind of how much to give or take, right? Because, you know, you're mentioning Tesla with 50 cents. For someone like myself with Tesla too, a, a Tesla and NVIDIA, the way those guys can jump up and down like little jumping beans there, you have to sometimes, you know, if it's a wick, you kind of have to be very cognizant of that, kind of know what your comfort level is, but also right. recognize that those stocks will move like wildfire, They'll and then they'll go right back to, you know, the downside or upside, right? So it's really just kind of, um, being cognizant of what, and I think the more you trade and figure out what stocks you like, the more you're aware of how those stocks move, because no, no two stocks move alike. No. Sometimes they might move in tandem, but they're not gonna all move necessarily the same way. Also, a huge shout out to Finch Jane. I think I like to suffer for buying Tesla. <laughs> I just enjoyed that comment. And as a Stressla, Bestla fan myself, oh, yeah. fully agree. Fully, um, I understand your pain, but we're here. I want to address something that Adam said in the chat, and he, Adam DeLuce, shout out to Adam, best Arsenal fan on here, uh, including myself. He's, he's better than me. But, look, he says something very specific. It depends on if it's a wick or a print, and more, oh, I could good. not agree. You guys know how I feel about closing prints versus these wicks, especially if you're trading on a, a, lower, a higher time frame. You know how these one minute, you're going to get whipsawed one way or another, even on a closing print on the one minute. That's the whole point of moving to the higher time frame. I 
respect closing prints more than I respect wicks. It's where I chart off. It's uh, it's the level that, like for example, you know how I feel about the closing prints on things. So, uh, the daily closing prints. It, it's a very important key uh, resistance and support level for me. So, Adam, I agree with you. Um, I put more weight on the closing print, especially at higher time frames, than I do on the wicks. Thanks for pointing that out. All right, uh, let's go on, guys. Uh, keep uh, keep bringing in the uh, questions here uh, with respect to moving average envelopes. Again, not my uh, most. Uh, I'm not the most savvy user of this indicator, but I would love to answer any questions the best I can. Shout out uh, to everybody in the chat asking good questions there. Shout out to Fry Rye. Shout out to Glenn Smith, Michael Lloyd, Finch Jane, um, Ponzi Fonzi, killing it, Ponzi. Uh, no Lambo trade for you today, just only Honda Civics. Barranquilla, 2020 hookup. That's got to be one of the best names in the chat there, man. Uh, I'm assuming you made that account because you were probably selling uh, trips to Barranquilla in 2020, and it's 2024 almost. Uh, a good that right, broke my brain that's almost 2024. Barranquia is a city in Colombia who, uh, like, I have a best guy friend and okay. a best girlfriend, and she's from Barranquia. Oh, that's yeah, cool. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, so shout out to her, Melly, Melissa, uh, killing it there. Uh, she, so, she watches the show, show sometimes. That's awesome. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, all right. So... Any other questions, guys? I think uh, you have a question from Super SPAC. Oh, yeah. Okay. Th I just saw that, and I was like, yeah, I'd love to address that. Thank you, Super SPAC man, for the meta uh, back and forth we've been having in the chat today because um, we've been kind of talking about levels on meta. So thank you for that. The question is, are you considering a 324 break lower on meta? Honestly, I haven't looked at meta for a little bit. I'm going to be honest with you. Um, yeah, 324, if we, like, we're kind of just above 324 right now. So I would, I would kind of like to wait and see on this. I don't want to react too hastily but you're right like definitely i was looking at the the five day or like the week um chart on that um so i uh super stack man so i see what you mean like meta has been super weak this week um especially compared to other weeks if you're you know kind of going to talk about the four week rule yeah if we don't break above this 325 because this 322 323 to 325 range has been of interest to me so i'm going to keep an eye on that see how that is shaking um, so thank you very much for Super SPAC Man for pointing that out. Like these levels are definitely important. I also want to bring up Eli Lilly because I am happy. Um, we got in happy. at this um, 591, where did I get 591? So we got in a little bit lower than I would have liked. Um, I didn't want to chase the trend too much, but we saw the lower movement. I saw a little bit of stagnance, but still lower movement down at 580, 591. Scott swept in there and then we flew to the downside and I was like, bless up, got into Eli bless Lilly here, up. got out, tried to get out my whole position. We only got part filled here um, at this 589.50 area. So that's $1.50 in the money. Um, I will not complain. I will be happy. I will smile. Um, so we, yeah, we just got filled entirely. So super happy with that. Why 589? Because five, or sorry, why 589.50? Because this is where we were really seeing the chop and churn around here, um, especially, you know, like right as we opened, we spent, how long? We spent like an hour chopping and turning around that 589. So I figured that's a level. We're gonna make our exit. Thank you for the support in the chat. Oh yeah, Super SPAC man, looking at the five minute chart, there was a bit of a high wick a few candles ago, thinking that is the exit point. Yeah, I'm gonna, I have a three minute on right now just because Eli Lilly's wicks are stressing me out. Uh -huh. But I will look at meta on the five minute. Thank you um, very much, Super SPAC man. And yeah, so that is our little, uh, my little Eli Lilly interlude there. Okay, Mr. Love Shack uh, bringing up a really good point here, not one that I can really chime in on, but he says the uh, moving average envelope is useful for picking strike prices for options on a longer time frame. Very interesting. As you guys know, I don't trade options, nor am I well-versed in them, but um, interesting to see others are using it for reasons you know that I didn't know about. So make sure, obviously, that you're back testing all this stuff before uh, you are employing it in the wild with real money. Um, I don't have back testing ability on my platform, but Trade Ideas does. It lets you back test about three months or so uh, behind, I believe it was three months, we asked Michael Noss last time, which is not bad. Um, I know Thinkorswim does as well. It has a back testing feature on there. If you don't have a back testing feature, then you need to be trading in the SIM and you need to prove profitability in the SIM before you ever use real money. 
plain and simple. If you can't make money in the sim, you have no business trading real money in real life. Yeah. Okay. As someone who's still in sim, yeah. Yeah. Like, this sim I mean, exists for a reason. Because it's just going to get harder. Yeah, and it helps you like feel confident, and know what strategies work and don't work. Exactly. I think, yeah. And if you have to stay in the sim for years, stay in, yeah. right? I mean, obviously, you're going to have to have another job, <laughs> right, to pay the bills or if you yeah. have uh, rich parents or whatever your situation is. But you've got to prove profitability. If you're yeah. not profitable in the sim, why are you using real money? It's just going to get harder because then you're going to have to include the psychological component of taking big L's, real L's, not yeah. sim L's, right? So that's just my uh, little two cents there. Fry Rye. For example, I use the 8MA to give me an idea of a trend, and if it crosses a 21 MA, I think of the downtrend, vice versa. Yeah, we talked about this, my friend. We talked about this on Monday when we introduced moving averages. We talked about exponential and simple, what they're used for. We talked about the crossover method. We talked about the support and resistance method. You need to understand your, your system is good, but it is only good, this crossover method, eight and 20, look, 21 you're using there, it's only good in trending markets. If you use it in consolidative markets, you will get multiple false buy and sell signals and you'll take so many dang paper cuts, you're gonna hate using them. So the number one thing when you're about to use the crossover method for moving average is you need to determine, are we in a consolidative market or are we in a trending market? That's easier said than done. And it's gonna take practice to be able to determine that. It may look on its face, prima facie, that we are like in. And you're like, legal terms. There we go. Prima uh, fashion case. <laughs> you know about that? I watch Law and Order. How do you know that? I watch so, okay. well, I'm also a crim major and okay. I watch a lot of Law and Order. All right. So kind of right. combo, yeah. I but like I, li it. I like I when like you throw it. out the legal terms. There you I'm go. Like, I know this stuff. Um, you, it may look like we are trending, but we may actually be with, locked within a, a wider um, range, right? And so that's what you need to really go back historically and chart for, okay? Yeah. Um, moving down, Hayden, Hayden Ponish. Shreve, what are your thoughts on trading with a prop firm versus trading in sim as a beginner or someone still trying to find consistency? Uh, that's a very good question. Uh, I like the prop firm setting, not just because I'm here, but because uh, when I, tr I traded at home for two years on my own, and then I came here. And I gotta tell you, the amount of learning and the improvement that I've made on this floor since be being here is like multiplied by two of what I did on my own, despite the fact that I was watching the show literally every day um, during the lockdown with the big kahunas on, right? And Brendo, obviously. And they, uh, yeah, they had a couple other people on at the time who are no longer here, but. Um, yeah, I, I, I'm very much for the prop firm setting. That's just my personal experience. Maybe yours would be a bit different, but I, I like the prop firm. You can also trade on SIM in the prop firm, so they're, they're not mutually exclusive things. You can do both. Uh, being in the prop firm setting, bouncing ideas off so many people rather than you know just you know going with your own ideas when you're at home, I found to be very, uh, very helpful. So that's just my little thought on that. Um, Fry Rye goes on to say, you missed the other part. Uh, sorry, oh yeah, sorry, I didn't scroll all the way up. Uh, Peter Sun, yeah, volume and the type of market very important and chop sideways can get you wrecked, even if indicators say otherwise. Couldn't agree more, Peter. Uh, very, very accurate on that. Moving down here. Mr. Long Shorts, any advice for someone who is trying to start a day trade the world office on their own? I don't know what uh, is required for that, but I'm sure if you reach out to them, there's gonna be more than enough people on the other side of the office. That's where the day trade the world people are. They will probably get back to you on that and you know give you all the deets. Personally, I know I've met people that who have come in here to tour the office because they were, they were interested in opening their own office. Personally, I don't know what's involved. Uh, with that whole thing, but hmm. it's we have like tons of offices, you know that like over like 200 offices all over the world. Yeah, yeah, yeah I was yeah. aware. It's, like it's it was I, before. I had no idea how like yeah. massive it is. Like really, the the world really is being day traded. I day trade the world. Yeah. <laughs> everywhere. You're I'm killing sorry. me, bro. Uh, you're, you got the production team slow clapping over there. <laughs> uh, is that the Chile nightmare? Yeah, yeah I can tell. Yeah. Uh, Matt, sorry, real everyone. human, hilarious. I love your name, Matt. Uh, glad to see the lines on your shirt are symmetrical today. 
I like the what shirt. What can I say? I'm also, it's please. crazy. It's almost the same color as the yesterday it's one. It's not. Too. That one was blue. This is black. I or this, this is charcoal. Blue. Oh, This charcoal. is charcoal. Sorry. Yeah. This is blue? For real? You, you see this as blue, Ram Ram? No, man. This is like dark charcoal, black. With These are obviously gray. All right. That's probably not uh, the appropriate topic. David, <laughs> what what you think about Forex trading? I've never traded Forex. Uh, that's a lie. Uh, I've traded Forex one time, and that was to buy American dollars using my Canadian dollars <laughs> on uh, on my platform. Because before, that's crazy. yeah, yeah, um, I like that. my platform wouldn't let you trade. You it, it, long time ago. This has changed. Uh, it wouldn't let you trade U.S. equities if you deposited Canadian dollars. You have to take those Canadian dollars that you deposited by U.S. dollars by doing a Forex trade, and then you were able to trade U.S. equities. That's no longer the case. You can deposit Canadian money and buy with U.S. equities, and then you get the spot conversion rate. Uh, that's how it works now. That's the only reason I've ever done that. Um, I see a lot made online about Forex trading. I've never experienced it, so I have nothing to add. Um, Super SPAC man, I know Sharif doesn't like the three minute. Oh, I think we're just still talking about meta. And I think it's just the meta short. I think oh, that's what that's. I don't dislike the three minute. I don't. Yeah, I, I, I have my one minute. Everyone on has for my their own preference. Yeah. yeah. No, no, I have no beef with the three minute. I personally like the five, the one, the fifteen, and the daily. Yeah. Right. And I uh, for when I chart at the big desk in the morning when we're doing the future, I use yeah. the four hour. Oh, okay, that's yeah. cool. Yeah. Well, that makes sense too because the futures are like longer term, right? So Absolutely. Longer term because I know also for your futures trades you look at the longer term levels. Exactly. Which is very cool. Key resistance and yeah. support levels. Bang yeah, on. I like it. Uh, Mr. Longshore says I'm already in the process. I mean, for trading by myself. Look, I mean, the point of being on a prop firm, it, there, there's really two reasons for, for me to be on a prop firm. One, you don't have your own capital, you need to use somebody else's capital, or two, to, or in addition to that, uh, to learn off others who are here. You know, when you, when you join the floor here, you go through uh, a learning course that's taught by the floor manager and the assistant manager. Uh, it's like bi-weekly, I think, two, twice a week, I mean. Um, and then they teach you our strategies here that are proprietary to day trade the world. However, when you're trading in day in and day out, these guys, they sit, you think they sit there in isolation, they don't talk to each other? No, they're bouncing ideas off each other all yeah. the time. So the, pr the purpose of a prop floor for me are twofold. One, you don't have the money, or two, you need ideas and you want to riff back and yeah. forth with people. So that's well, I still remember like my first day actually like trading. I mean, mm -hmm. obviously like trading sim, but I remember afterwards, you know, everyone was like, "Oh, how was your first day?" Like we were talking ideas, we were talking like strategy. I had traded some small caps, and they kind of went badly, and then you know what I mean? Like right. I was just kind of talking with everybody, and it was really valuable. Like it was cool too to be in an environment especially as someone who knew like nothing go going into it right. where everyone's really willing to support you and always kind of willing to like talk trades, like yes. what works, what doesn't. Cause I think, you know, everyone's going to have different perspectives and different strategies, but being able to, you know, bounce off your strategies and find out what works for different people. I think it's always really good conversation. Okay. So yeah, that's cool. my, that's my, that's my two cents or three cents or four cents or whatever. That is my take there. Also, um, shout out to Benzinga, um, our sponsor here. Um, brought to you by Benzinga Pro. Uh, use the link in the description for Benzinga's Black Friday deal. Uh, the greatest deal of the year, and it includes 75% off Benzinga Pro. Monthly subscriptions now as low as $49.25. So this is the everything terminal for retail trailers. Traders, not trailers. You know, like Sharif's <laughs> always saying, I'm using Benzinga Pro all the time. Oh, yeah. I'm using it left, right, and center. Um, and yeah, all you have to do is just visit pro.benzinga.com. Use the coupon code. Um, TTV and OV for November, and then save 75% off now, but new subscribers only, and conditions do apply as they tend to. Hola, like and subscribe today. Hello, Cat. It's Cat in the Hat. Oh, yeah, you were saying your new nickname. She's been anointed a new nickname. Hola. It's Cat in the Hat, baby. She's wearing her glasses today. I like the glasses. Cat, wave. Hey, Katrine. <laughs> Love Cat in the Hat. All right. Um, Questions before Adara takes us through the second topic. Quickly, let me just uh, do a quick scan here. Uh, just trying to take some questions from some other people so everybody gets in. Uh, Atif, Atif Tabet. I know that name. Uh, Sharif, do you have a branch in Calgary? Brendo, do we have a DTDW in Calgary? 
Huh? No idea, <laughs> he says, okay. All right, I'll get back to you on that, Atif. Um, when uh, the, the Katina man returns, I will be asking him. Uh, he's out uh, on lunch right now with Jeff Mendel. So I get to interview Jeff, and then he takes him out for lunch. That's how it works around here. Um, all right. Mr. Longshort, yeah, I need something like that. The riffing. Yeah, man, I'm telling you. Like, you think these guys, like, they're friends. That's the thing. They drink together on Fridays. They, and they talk about trading, like, literally at that hangout. It's, it's, it's trading all the time on the yeah, floor it here. It is trading all the yeah, time. Yeah, I mean, I love it. I got to tell you the truth. It's uh, one of the best decisions I think I've ever made to come here. Uh, that's just the way I feel. All right, Adara, let's go. Next level, four-week rule. One, two, three, four weeks. Um, so four-week rule. Um, basically, uh, this, this it's, uh, trading systems are generally like thought of as complex computer programs that often require a lot of data. But sometimes in trading, the best solution is the simplest. And I think that sometimes that's the case with life as well. Uh, but one of the best known trading systems uh, doesn't even require a computer, and that is the four-week rule. So this uh, rule in basically the simplest form, you buy when prices reach a new four-week high and you sell when they reach a new four-week low. So new four-week high basically means that prices have exceeded the highest level that they've reached over the past four weeks. And that four-week low would mean uh, basically the opposite. They've reached, they're now trading lower than they have any time over the past four weeks. So this system is um, always in the market, long or short. Uh, it's known as the four-week rule, and it's actually the system uh, designed by the guy that we recently learned a couple days ago is the father of trend uh, following, and that is Richard Dahlian. <laughs> um, so this strategy is going to be on the right side of the big moves in the market, but it does have a low percentage of winning trades uh, because most of the markets tend to trend only about a third of the time. And this, I mean, you need to like break uh, above or below trends, right? So generally, this 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 guy needs a little bit more of. Um, a bit more trend following, but because markets aren't always trending, it gets a little bit difficult. Um, so in some markets, the four, uh, four week rule might only be right less than 40% of the time. And the other trades are usually small losses, which occur um, while the market consolidates with choppy price actions. So like we were saying, a lot of times, it's kind of hard to use uh, a lot of these systems in consolidating markets, right? Um, a lot of these more, I guess, not, not complex indicators, but indicators that require a skosh more um, data. Um, but yeah, so using the four-week rule, here's an example. This was the same one we used earlier. I'm going to just get this ready, pull it up, zoom in a little bit here. So yeah, here was, um, this is, is Google here. So basically you would buy, as we broke this new high, you buy right at this 5, 25, 78. This is before the shares were split. And then um, you kind of let it run up for a little bit here. It's running up beautifully. As you can tell, this is kind of usually a longer-term strategy. Um, and then, yeah, we hit a new four-week low. That's where you sell. So you still made a decent amount of money, but you had to strategize there. So that's kind of what this strategy is in a little nutshell there. Um, yeah, so basically this Google trade, yeah, you found a new four-week high, you bought Google, then you sold it when it made a new four-week low. Uh, and this, this would have resulted in, this hypothetical trade would have resulted in 18% gain. Um, so it did work, but you know, sometimes you have to wait for the payoff and you have to wait for your point of entry, right? But the problem is that it was up by more than 30% at one point and you actually gave up nearly half the profits before giving a sell signal. So that is what um, we were talking about, uh, actually like you know, Sharif was saying earlier, that's one of the issues with this uh, strategy at its face is that it can go a little bit against you. Um, so one way to address the problem of staying in a trade too long is to change the exit rules. So instead of following the original four-week rule uh, to exit a position, traders can actually um, exit when a moving average is broken. So for example, applying a 10-day moving average as the exit criteria on a Google Doc um, or a Google trade, sorry, shown there uh, would have increased the profits by about 25%. So yeah, so instead of uh, using the 10-day moving average, which would actually be two weeks because a trading uh, month is 20 days. So if you use 10-day moving average, you're using the two-week rule, I guess, to get out there. Um, a 10-day moving average was selected, yeah, because it's half the entry signal. Um, but any time period shorter than the entry single signal could be used for a point of exit. So another way of exiting um, the four-week rule is called trend filtering. So you put a trend filter Bang. over the overall market. For many traders, it can actually be um, a challenge to determine whether the market is bullish or bearish on a short-term basis. Because like we were saying, this is a longer-term, uh, generally kind of a longer-term trading uh, usage because four-week rule inherently implies, you know, you have to wait for a while too to wait for it to make a new four-week high. So you've got a lot of sitting here waiting for this one, but if you use it as a trend filter, it can kind of be a little more interesting. So it allows traders to objectively define a trend. 
if the market's most recent signal in the system is a buy, um, then the trader can be confident that the market is in an uptrend. Uh, and downtrends can be defined basically as times when the four week, uh, when the most recent four week rule signal was a sell. So in other words, the market has made a new four week low uh, more recently than it made a new four week high. Um, so using this as a filter, the trader would then look for the four week rule to be on a buy signal before entering new long positions and then short positions, the exact opposite. You'd only um, be entering if the market was on a new four week uh, rule sell signal. So a new four week low. Um, and I was saying to Sharif too, I think what could be really interesting to use in a short term is if you use the four week rule or like these, the, you know, trend filtering on stuff like the SPY or the NASDAQ, so then you can see if the wider market Absolutely. is perhaps selling or buying. So I know you use the NASDAQ a lot. I think it is, you know, generally giving you market uh, vibes, how the market's yeah. feeling. So if you use something like this to kind of filter trends on that, I think that could be useful. And that's something I would like to kind of work on. Yeah, guys, and you know, one of the things we've also talked about is being able to determine whether we're in an uptrend or sorry, or whether the market is trending or whether it's consolidating because that affects what indicators we use. For example, we don't use moving averages in consolidative markets and we try to stay away from oscillators in trending markets. Those are two general rules. But being able to determine, to determine if we're trending or consolidating can be hard in of itself. And this is one of those um, techniques, let's call it that, to help determine if we're trending, if we're continuing to make new four-week highs or new highs within the intervening four weeks, gives you a bit of a, an indication of what we're doing, or lows, right, for a downtrend market. So this rule, aside from being one that you can use to swing trade and to long-term invest, it can be one to help you determine what kind of market we're in right now whether we're consolidative uh, and it's a sideways market or whether we're trending up or down. So uh, I wanted to kind of give you guys an idea about that. That's cool. Um, Northwest, Northwestern Canopy Development, RSI is one of the very best oscillators. I'll never trade without it. Fair. A lot of people love relative strength and we're going to get to oscillators, I promise you. But we wanted to, next week we're going to talk about psychology. I'm so excited for psychology week. We're going to get in, um, you know, the chairs, do some oh, yeah. trade psychoanalyzing. And oh, I yeah. think especially because we've been doing a lot of really chart heavy stuff mm -hmm. uh, the past two weeks. I mean, we're obviously still going to look at charts and, you know, maybe we can like talk through how we're look, looking at trades emotionally and stuff next week. I'm very excited for, um, for Trade Psychology Week next yep. week, and hopefully everyone else will get something out of it, because I think we had a lot of questions too, I guess, uh, related to Trade Psychology, came up a little bit during Risk Management Week, so I think there could hopefully be a lot to be gotten out of it. All right, guys, in anticipation of uh, the Psychology Week, as we'll call it, um, a very good book that you can read, and you probably, you don't have to read the whole thing, obviously, over the weekend, but begin reading it. It is one of the better Preparing books. Preparing, study yeah. yeah. Yeah, uh, one of the better books that is out there for uh, trading psychology is this one, Mark Douglas, Mark Douglas's Trading in the Zone. This is kind of considered as the Bible of psychology or trading psychology in the same way that um, John J. Murphy's uh, Technical analysis of the financial markets is considered kind of the Bible of TA, technical analysis. This is one of those ones that's going to really help you put things into perspective. Oh. Is this the entire book? What in the actual hell? I didn't mean to actually load up the whole book. Oh, there's little, you can like yeah. do a little q and I might have to do that in preparation. Yeah. I think I'm going to be doing some. So I'll probably take this off so that we don't have uh, copyright issues here. I didn't actually mean yeah, to Yeah, I could tell you the, had no idea. Yeah, no, I had no idea. I thought it was like the Amazon picture or Hot something twist. like that. But yeah, guys, uh, one of the best books uh, to read. Uh, I've read it a couple of times. It's one of those ones where I think to really internalize it and to really absorb everything that it has to say, you got to read it a couple of times, if not even more than that. I know there's traders out there that read it once a year uh, to really help reinforce its principles, reinforce its ideas. Um, are we having issues with my mic? Yeah, I'll give it to you for a second. Adair, you want to take Let's over? Let's do it. Yeah, for sure. Um, so I saw um, David in the chat uh, taking Sharif and I. What are your favorite strategies? Um, I like scalping. I have said it. I will say it. Um, with that in mind, too, in terms of entering and exiting trades, I think, and I learned a lot of this, um, too, 
from you know being in the midday here with Sharif is buying uh, like low looking for um lower lows um and lower highs for like a short opportunity or um, higher highs and higher lows for a long. So I like to look at the chart. I also like to look at the tape uh, in terms of getting in on levels and seeing where we're seeing like support and resistance, right? And using that in, um, in tandem with the chart to plan my entries and exits. I have also been a lot more cognizant about getting into long positions when you're down on the day, getting into shorts when you're up on the day. And really like sometimes too, I like to wait for confirmation, like see a couple candles to the upside before I get into a long, and then, um, you know, same with like downside, you know, like waiting to see a couple candles to the downside before you get into a short. I've been trying, my new thing is kind of just like trying to wait and see, but I am a super new trader. I am still trading sim. So I'm trying to learn my strategies, figure out what I like as we kind of go along. Um, Helix in the chat, yeah, nobody in a position. I'm looking for a position. I'm waiting. I have to see what Eli Lilly does at 587. If we go above 587, I see a couple green candles to the upside. I'm going to like do a reversal on that thing, take it long run to the high side here. Um, uh, Super SPAC man, could you, uh, tagging us, could you and Adara help others foresee the compression that appears to be happening sure, in the meta one that. minute chart and how to gauge whether it goes up or down? Okay, so I gotta disagree oh. that uh, we're getting a compression pattern here on meta. Uh, with all due respect, chart, yeah, th oh, this the is okay. the five. Yeah, okay. I'm looking at the five. I can look at the one, no problem. Um, whether it's on the one or five, I should be able to see the pattern, especially a compression pattern on both the one and the five. And I have to respectfully disagree. I do not like this pattern on Meta for anything. Now we did get a nice double bottom here, if you wanna call it that, and we kind of got a few consolidative candles trending up ever so slowly. Uh, it's not one, um, it's not something that I'm ready to jump into for whatever reason. We had an obvious downtrend with lower highs, lower lows all throughout the morning from that first print at 9.30 till that low low was made at 11.30. We had two hours of very straight directional downtrend. And then we're getting now consolidative. We're moving sideways. Yeah, sure, we're above two bucks from the low, but look at this. This is as consolidative as it gets. It's not interesting me one way or another, nor long, nor short. I'm staying out of this one. Um, you wanna trade meta, absolutely go ahead. Maybe you'll print, maybe you'll get a VWAP retracement. That's always in the cards, right? We're incrementally moving up. So you could get a 327 here, especially if we retake, uh, I believe 59, 59 decisively on the NQ. But for the moment, I'm gonna have to say nah -uh, uh, for nah. me on uh, meta. Now, we had a good question here um, from uh, Sally. What's up, Sally? Uh, Elon Musk has entered the cyber truck event. I thought that was starting at three. Yeah, maybe he's getting there early to, um, to you know, try to yell at Bob Iger or something. No, I'm joking. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm terrible. Yeah, there, Ram Ram has it up on the screen there. There you go. I also have had it up all day. Because have you? I've, okay. yeah, oh, look, we can bring it down to Yeah, there it. it is. Two hours, uh, seven minutes, and 14 seconds. There, are whatever. The excitement that yeah. I am feeling about this event it's gonna be big. is excited. Yeah. It is exciting. Well, <laughs> I'm like giddy over here. It's not a bad here. look. It's not a bad look. Right, yeah. Um, we're doing that dance at 15.9, guys. We're gonna restart the topics in about seven minutes. When we get back to one o'clock, we're gonna start talking about moving average envelopes. Between now and then, go ahead and put your questions in the chat. Everything's uh, open. You want, to, you want us to look at stocks? You wanna talk about any of the other lessons that we had on previous days? It's an open, uh, it's an open uh, season right now for seven, seven minutes or so. Um, Sally's saying it's a live stream on YouTube, oh. so I'm not exactly I sure. I might be live streaming that on the background with whatever else I'm doing at three. Also, I like this um, R. Moore's question here. Microsoft we'll making a it. higher low, still new. You know what, R. Moore, I would like to wait for another candle of confirmation for myself. I would concur. It looks like we have a skosh of a higher low on Microsoft. And that's yes. in the five minute anyway. Let's look at the, yeah, I think three minute, it's also pretty look. clear. Yeah. I would say, um, you know, I always, I, I know for myself too, when you're new and you see a trend happening, it's really exciting. So congrats to you, Armour. I would say right now it does look like a higher low. Thank you so much for bringing this one to our attention. I will keep an eye on it as we do the dance towards VWAP. Uh, but like I said, usually I would kind of wait like for like another green candle for myself just to kind of confirm yeah. this. Generally though, um, not a bad look at all for Microsoft. Is down on the day though right now, so I would be, for myself, a skosh cautious with a long, but yeah, thank you for bringing that one to our attention. David, I'm 19. Do I start trading as full-time? 
that's really up to you. I mean, uh, you're 19, I'm assuming you probably live at home and I don't, I don't know what your life is like, what your expenses are like, but obviously most people, they've got bills that need to be met every month. And uh, the reality is uh, when you initially start trading, you're not gonna be making money. In fact, you're probably gonna be losing money. Uh, that's just the hard reality. Um, unless you're somehow gifted beyond uh, belief, but uh, get in, get in. Don't let that deter you. Um, what I would say is if you can balance it some way with a part-time job or you trade during the day and you know you go to work in the afternoon and you're able to do that for a, a while, and I'm talking about years, um, I think that that's your best bet. And all the while, you're accumulating some money, you're putting some money in the account for day trading, you're putting some money in the long-term account for your long, pardon me, for your long-term holdings. You have a good balance between the two. You're obviously very young. You have a lot of time, a lot of time. 19 is really young. Um, and if you start doing this kind of stuff right now, you really will thank yourself later. You just have to put in the, the time. It's years. Right? And that's just the way that I uh, feel about that. Um, all right, moving down here. Let's see what else is being talked about. D. Westermeyer, what's up, my man? I am really liking the Williams percent for my Forex futures. Any experience with Williams? No, uh, I don't uh, have any experience with that. Uh, sadly, neither do I have uh, experience with uh, Forex. So sorry I couldn't help there, uh, D. Um, Havana Woody, what, your, what are your thoughts on these low flow gappers? He calls them crappers, but he knows. I know why he's doing that, because <laughs> I used to. Uh, C-Y-T-O and B-G-L-C. Let's have a look, my man. Uh, let's bring in the side chart, the trusty side chart. Look at a firm. Look at a firm go, baby. Okay, a firm's retracing Ooh. here. Okay, I just had that one up by accident. It's doing the roundy face. <laughs> I'm so sorry. C-Y-T-O. This company is... Um, Altamira Therapeutics. Here we oh. go. Let's have a look at the five-minute chart. Yeah, well, this one will take a minute to load here. I'm sorry, guys. Give it a second. Let's go. There we go. Um, let's First of all, let's like look at the daily there. chart. <laughs> oh, God. I hate when these small-cap gappers take a, a while to load up on my system. We're going to have to give this a second here. I need to see the, the daily level before I can talk about anything here. And obviously, it's taking a real long time. It does not want you to, to small cap. No, it doesn't want me to look at it for whatever reason. We're going to have to wait, 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 wait. All right, maybe I'll uh, get to something else while we're waiting for this one to wait, uh, to load. Zion Lala. What's up, my man? Great work. Are you planning on giving, up a, giving us a pop quiz soon? Ram Ram DM'd me, and she's like, be a really good idea if you guys, if you quiz them at the end. And I said, well, maybe I'll quiz Adara and everybody can chime in. Yeah, I mean, we, you do that sometimes <laughs> already, I right? Do. And so, I, you know, I don't mean to obviously. No, 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 I, I, I don't mind it. Like, I, I think it helps me learn too and make sure mm -hmm. I really get it. And if I don't get something, then I have the opportunity to yeah. figure it out. So, All right. no complaints there. Here's CYTO um, on the daily. So, clearly, we're a 10 penny stock. Um, in early November, it looks like we just got to market. I don't know if this one uh, was, I don't know what the history of this one is, but my charting only starts on November 7th. We're sub 10 pennies, okay? And then we have a fabulous day, uh, November 17th, where we do, uh, we flirt with that 50 penny area. And we do the same thing again on the 20th, which is probably a Monday. We come back down into that 20 penny area and then boom goes the dang dynamite yesterday as we popped off 20 pennies and knocked on the door of that dollar today. We don't have much, uh, we, it's an inside day today because we are above yesterday's lows and below yesterday's highs. So this is a bullish engulfing candle, okay? We're gonna have to wait to see what, what comes of tomorrow, but we are very much an inside day. On the five minute look here, Look, we're obviously below yesterday's highs. We're making lower highs. We're making lower lows on CYTO. To me, the clear levels were that 20 penny area and uh, the 50 penny area. And um, obviously that $1 area that we couldn't break through yesterday. And this is what I'm talking about up here. We're below 50 pennies right now. So that, that was an area of support as we came down in here, consolidated sideways for a bit and looks like we gave up the ghost. So until this one starts changing the trend 
uh, of lower highs and lower lows, I'm not interested in as a long. It's got to change the trend and make higher highs, higher lows for me to be interested in the long trade. Now, I don't know what the short availability is for this on our system or on mine. Um, I'm willing to assume it's probably not tradable or not available for short on IBKR, but here on the system, we have shorts for everything. Just how much does it cost? So I don't like it right now, um, Havana. Uh, as a long, it's got to get above 50 pennies and close decisively and make higher highs for me to get interested. Um, Zion, we already mentioned that one. Saul G, I know you spoke about it before, but why do you look at the NQ versus the SPY? Very good question. Uh, I don't care for the SPY. Um, and I don't care for the triple Qs. Maybe I'm wrong, but I'm interested in what institutions are doing, not what retail traders are doing. And institutions use future contracts to hedge their investments, like okay? That's what big money is doing. So I wanna see what's being done on the NQ and on the spot. There's a second reason. I trade the Meg 7 a lot, thanks to the Katina man who got me onto that. The Meg 7, much more influenced and much more influencing by, on the NQ and by the NQ than on the, the ES. The ES has 500 companies from all over the market, whereas the NQ is 100 companies and they're all tech. Okay, And we know what the weighting of the Meg 7 is on the uh, NQ versus what the weighting is on the ES. It's much larger on the NQ. So I like the NQ for those two reasons, and I like the futures contracts for the reason that it is used by institutional money and uh, not retail. No disrespect to retail, myself included. I just want to know what the, uh, the big money is doing, okay? That's fair. Yeah. Eric, Tesla, Cybertruck, 3 p.m., what will be the impact on the stock? Good question. Um, now, there's a couple of things that can happen here. It could be a nothing burger, or a few things that could happen. It could be a nothing burger. It could be a sell the news event, in, in essence, where you trend up in anticipation of the event, and then once the event unfolds, you sell. And that happens all the time. Meta it, connect, cough, 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 cough. <laughs> you, cough. She said it. She said it right there. Sorry, but I um, or there could be something novel that we didn't anticipate that gets announced during that event, in which case there's a very good chance we could trend up or down. If there is something said that the market doesn't necessarily like, anything can happen. It would be silly for me to opine on uh, what is more likely to happen than not, but those are the options, okay? Um, Dale Rousar, he says Sharif eyes, but no question. So shout out to Dale. Uh, Callum Mitchell Miller, Sharif, can you go 10 minutes without pressing the bang button? I cannot, oh. my friend. I think I did though right now. I haven't I was gonna say, I think you've gone like 10 <laughs> to 15 minutes. Yeah, look. But also like it's not his fault he's excited, you know? Like, I'm an excitable be excited individual. Sometimes. And I'm a, I'm a cheerleader by nature. Yeah, I you really are. Like you're always nature. like rooting for everybody's mm -hmm. like success. And success yeah, yeah, growth. I want people to do yeah. well around me. And I think the bang button in general is like a good, like, you know, we're, we're cheering on people's trades. We're just cheering on people. Yeah, yeah. why not, like, right? Positive energy, baby. Ponzi, Elon just posted a Cybertruck pick on X. Oh, baby. Man, Elon, what can we say about Elon? <laughs> what a guy, eh? Um, I what think Bob guy. Iger might have a few words for yeah, Elon. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Elon had some words for Bob Iger. Let me tell you. He definitely did. Uh, anybody who doesn't know what Adair and I are talking about, Sorry. Google. What was it called? The book something? Deal book. Deal, deal NYT book. Deal Book Summit. The New York Times Deal Book Summit. He was words being, were said. Yeah. Yeah, words were said. He was being interviewed by Slippery Sorkin. Um, yeah, you'll, you'll get my feelings about Sorkin there. Uh, but uh, he, he let everybody have it yesterday. He let everybody know. And that's not the first time he's done that. He was very much like that with uh, David Faber in his May interview when David Faber asked him, he's like, why do you post these controversial tweets when you know it's going to affect your... Um, your, your stock price is going to affect how your investors look. He doesn't give a you-know-what. He doesn't. And he... <laughs> What'd you say, Ram Ram? <laughs> Ram Ram always trolling me back there, bro. All right, moving down here. Let's go. Guys, let's get the questions on uh, to the thing. D. Westermeyer, does the Triple Q have the same decay as other leveraged ETFs like Upro, for example? That's a really good question, and I don't know the answer to that. 
I will ask, though, the really good question. I know that there is ETF decay is a major issue. Um, I, sadly, I don't have the answer to that. I will get back to you, D. Westermeyer. Have a Thanks, man. That's what I was looking at. If you could look at BGLC, it has followed the same pattern, $1 back to 50. The dollar break now, it looks like CYTOs. Okay, let me just get to another question. I'll come back to that. Um, moving down, the haze, hit the bang at a spike, bro. <laughs> I'm not, I'm not going to do that. Nice reversal on CCL using your indicator, says JB. Let's have a look at CCL. What is that up to? Also, while you pull that up, Bob yeah. W in the chat, doubling me. I'm a Bob, and I enjoyed what Elon said, laughing emoji. Um, pretty funny. I, I, I enjoyed it. I don't Can know. I say the truth? I like the fact that he can speak his mind. I just wish it, I just wish he wasn't as verbose at times. Verbose. Right? Well, and I think it's funny because people do listen to him because after the whole, hi, Bob, where him. are you at? Or whatever. He, I'm, I'm paraphrasing. That's not what he said. But then um, today, all the Disney people were like like mass posting on X there that they were canceling the Disney subscriptions. And Disney did swoop a little bit for a while after that. Whoop. So, whoop. But right. yeah, so I think it's interesting. Sorry. Guys, Brendo is at the big desk and he's got a special guest, one we've seen before, and with a very, very good reception, we're gonna send it to Brendo now. Hey guys, yeah, thanks so much. Todd Shapiro's back, CEO and director of Red Light Holland. Uh, big day yesterday, it was earnings day for the company. Tell us about it. Yeah, thanks Brendan. Thanks for having me of back course. here on Trader TV. Thanks for everyone watching. Um, yeah, it was a great day. We reported our Q2 and, and you know, we did uh, a million in revenue. We've increased our year over year from the quarter before 30%. We are really proud of the steady and slow growth that the company has always told shareholders we were focused on while decreasing our burn. And I think that if people were to look at our company and look at our cautious cash spending, yeah. I would say, they would say, wow. Because there's a lot of irresponsible companies within the psychedelic sector especially. And if you were to go back and look at other companies, uh, you know, I'm not going to drop any names, but some lost a couple hundred million dollars in a few years. And now they're like, you know, insolvency and bankruptcy. Right. I would like to think that Red Light Holland is focused on that continual growth. And again, we are an everything mushroom fun uh, company with a great focus on, on psychedelics in the Netherlands. And that's going to be the key, right? And, and you touched on this last time we spoke a little bit in the sense that there's more to it right now than just the psychedelic aspect of it. Tell us a little bit about the farming side of things. Yeah, and the farm's a big one. Um, we have a farm right now in New Brunswick, Eel River Crossing. It's uh, doing like, you know, really well. It's a net positive business selling shiitake mushrooms. Uh, those shiitakes will end up, if you're Canadian, in 47 farm boys. It ends up at a bunch of restaurants. It'll make its way to other different types of Loblaws and your independent grocers, et cetera. So we get those mushrooms out there, which is really good. Our partners at AEM, however, they're like some of the biggest farmers in, in Canada. Um, and I mentioned their names last time on the show, Mike Maderos, Nick Ferlano, et cetera. And, and what I love about these guys is they're guiding us into a great mushroom coalition where we are building a farm in Peterborough. Right. Peterborough is just north of Toronto, for those who don't really know Canada. Uh, we bought 100 acres that we Beautiful own outright. Uh, yep, to, uh, 100 acres, you know, we own that land. It's a nice asset on the books. By the way, we're trading you know, basically at total asset value. I think it's like you know, great value. Of course, always do your due diligence. And the farm Trip. is moving along, by the way. We are really excited about doing um, all different types of exotics out of that farm. And we've given some guidance on it, financial guidance, of about 16 to 18 million in revenue. Wow. Um, unfortunately, and this is just the facts, some of the costs have gone up, building right. costs have gone up, inflation's gone up, trades have gone up, people are trying to get more money, you know, because they gotta spend more money, so it's like a difficult economy that way. With that being said, it won't hurt our margins of sales, and we don't think that it will hurt that investment into the farm to our path to profitability. Uh, this might be a, um Kind of benign question, but I think there's a lot of people that might be watching that have no idea how mushrooms grow. And if you haven't been to Canada lately, it's cold outside right now. So let's highlight maybe the process here. What does it take to actually get something from the farm to a store? Well, they're not grown in shit. <laughs> I'll tell you that. And I think people like to I, think I, that honestly, they are. Yeah, yeah, that, that's, yeah. There's like this perception of mushrooms are, are, are grown this old school way that they, you know there's odors coming from the farms and stuff. This is not the case. Especially with us, we're not dealing with white or brown mushrooms. We're dealing with shiitake. We're dealing with oyster. We're dealing with lion's mane. They're grown in bags of compost, essentially. Uh, that compost has different formulas. I, I don't necessarily need to share them, but some are like soy, some are straw, some are wood pellets, and, and they get put into a compost. And then proper farmers will understand of the process of scale to be able to then move them from base 
Bay-to-Bay -bay, where they eventually start to spread out mushrooms and then they get picked and put into grocery stores and, and shipped across not only just Canada, but into the United States and sometimes across the world as well. Amazing. Um, let's maybe highlight a few things for next year. What, what can people, I mean, it's crazy to think December is tomorrow, I believe, or two days from now. Yeah. Um, what, what's to come? What is to look forward to here for, for the sure. company? Well, I, I mean, it's so hard for like these quick segments for me, Brendan, to be able to talk about all the things going on for Red Light Holland because we have a list of portfolio companies that are all doing very well. Um, as we have this you know, path to profitability, we have a SR wholesale uh, division in, in the Netherlands that legally is probably pushing, and I mean pushing, selling the most amount of psilocybin um, in any company that's publicly traded. I mean, yeah. we are doing, uh, that company does very well well, profitable company, a great team over there. Uh, we sell you know, a lot of different magic truffles over there to over 200 smart shops, including two of our own that are called Mushroom and More. Uh, we're looking at potential expansion in that area. We're always looking at potential M&A, and we're always looking at increasing farm production in the Netherlands as well, where we own the magic truffle farm. We also own a home grow kit farm. Uh, we just got a really big order from a Germany company to co-package white label, like 80,000 kit order. We're wow. very excited about that. And then back here on Canadian soil, well, the build of the farm is really the biggest one. I mean, Red Light Hall investors are looking at me going like, when's it coming? Timelines are a little bit pushed back. I get that. It is construction, however. Um, and we're, we're really doing this right, though. I mean, you just don't go and barge down township stores and say, we're putting this 65,000 square foot farm on here. We're doing it absolutely properly. Test holes for the septic. We got to get, you know, public health of Peterborough first to issue, um, you know, that approval. So then we get the foundation permit. There's geotechnical reviews we have to go through. Facilities, like there's just a lot of little intricacies within the farm itself um, that we're working on. But I'm, I mean, we're still very excited about getting this to build. And speaking of which, it's kind of a prefab farm. So a lot of the stuff that we do behind the scenes here for permitting and everything doesn't mean we can't go ahead and start getting the process going. It actually gets built in the Netherlands and then shipped over here. This is a state-of-the-art farm and like I said we've given guidance on it for a big path to revenues um, and, and we're very excited to get there. Let's shift gears a little bit and touch on, uh, we talked a little bit about the regulatory side of things the last time you were here. As far as the timeline is concerned, going into 2024, are there any dates that investors need to know about as far as what could be possible on the regulatory side. Yeah, I mean, in Oregon right now, you should pay attention. They've just opened up a third clinic, not our company, of course, but so they're moving along with people using therapy for magic mushrooms over there, naturally occurring uh, uh, psilocybin, which is really great. So we're seeing how that is rolling out in Oregon. Uh, like I said last time, California is starting to talk about moving forward with this path. There's been big announcements in Australia. So we, you know, we have our ear to the ground and all this. New Zealand is talking about it as well. Quietly, I'm not supposed to say that out loud. Um, and back here in Canada, I think the thing we should be paying attention to most is, you know, is this a bipartisan issue? Um, you know, there, there's the Liberals, there's obviously the Conservative Party. Um, some aren't happy with Justin Trudeau right now. I think the majority don't seem to be happy with Justin Trudeau right now. You know, as a company, um, we have to be bipartisan ourselves because we want whatever government is in power to be able to help us get our magic truffles that have now been tested at Seacrest Laboratories in Montreal through rigorous testing. They've gone through stability testing. We're going to report soon on the five month stability testing. We're trying to get them into homogenized capsules. And you know, if it's not the liberal government down the road, perhaps it's Pierre Polyev, who by the way, knows our farmers very well. The last uh, time he spoke in the House of Commons, he was talking about the axe the tax and he gave an example of Carlton Mushroom Farm specifically. That's Mike Medeiros' farm. They're a very tight knit bunch. So you know, if Pierre becomes uh, our next leader, yeah. what will they do? And part of the bipartisan aspect of it is, how can we help our veterans first and foremost and first emergency responders? The world is crazy. I talked about this last time on the yeah, show. Yeah. And we just got to help people now, and that's our entire mission. And it's a great one. Um, we, I mean, we got some economic data this morning that was not very positive, so that could be coming, who knows, uh, sooner than uh, later as far as the political situation here in this country. Uh, everyone's sitting around waiting for this uh, event, Tesla event, to come <laughs> at, at 3 o'clock this afternoon. You just told me before you came on here that you actually have a reservation. Yeah, I, I, I um, listen, it's, it's interesting with Elon Musk. I, I used to like idolize this guy. He's kind of feels like he's going back and forth these days. Yeah. He's sort of pushing and he's pulling and he's kind of talking out of two sides of his mouth. No one can ever question uh, how unreal he is as an, as an attention getter. Yeah. Um, he's, he's, you know, some would say the best stock promoter of all time, in fact. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, uh, I, you know, I, I love the idea of, I, you know, I'm fortunate enough to have a place up north two hours from the city. Uh, so I always have to drive a four by four. And when that thing came out, I put my 
my $150 Rezzo. I never heard from them. By the way, Starlink sucked for me up there too. So oh, wow. I hope it's not as bad as my experience with Starlink that took forever to get a refund because you're speaking to AI bots and no people anymore. But, um, you know, I'm still a massive fan and, and it's a badass truck, right? Do you, what do it, you, I what, mean, yeah. it's going to be one of those things where it's, you know, one person will get it and then it'll maybe calm down a little bit. But absolutely. It's, yeah, it's, I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing the parking garages in Toronto, like all scraped crazy. at the top and crazy. everything. Like, what are you going to do with yeah. that thing here? Yeah, a couple hours to go here. I, I mean, 3 o'clock Eastern, we'll get um, this live stream, apparently, to uh, start. Great to see you. Thanks yeah. for coming. I want to do a quick giveaway. Oh, right. Can I yeah. do this? I don't Do I have a minute? We have free stuff, yeah, guys. Yeah, I don't know. I know you guys. I just know you have a chat. Like, you have a chat going now. Yeah, yeah, I yeah. love the Trader TV engaged audience. Yeah, Thank yeah. you all. Uh, Trip is our ticker symbol. Do your due diligence. Truff on the American side. I know there's a lot OTC, of Americans yeah. watching. Um, anyone who puts their email address in right now, and I'll do it up to 15 or 20 people. I don't care. Uh, I'm going to get you a, we'll make sure we'll get your uh, address after, and we're going to ship you some Xmas gifts. Uh, That's some, awesome. You know, yeah, so here's Thank a red light hoodie. That's awesome. We got a red light hat. This one was worn by me, so it might be a little dirty. Um, I don't <laughs> trust anything on my head. Nobody does. But yeah, seriously, like go uh, send us your emails. Let's get you engaged into our red light army, our red light family. And uh, we're about the right to try magic mushrooms and hopefully add a, a, you know, a better place for positive change for yeah, everybody. 100%. So we love it. Uh, thank you so much. Yeah. That's, that's really generous, yeah. guys. There you go. Look, so beautiful first, hats. First zoom 15. in on this. How do we zoom? Look at that. First 15 yeah. emails, guys. Do it right yeah. now. We'll go back. We'll get the emails. I won't give you that one, though. That's we'll all. send out yeah. the hoodies. We'll send out hats. Okay. Todd, Thanks. Todd Shapiro, Man, CEO. You're awesome. Okay. And Happy. director of Cheers. Red Light Hauling. Good to see you. Thanks very much for that, Brendo. Put your email in the chat if you guys want merch. Thanks to our guest, Todd Shapiro, for informing us, as always, on the psilocybin business, up-and-coming business. Uh, no matter how you feel about it, um, we are always interested in uh, hearing what other people think and, um, and learning about new industries, especially one as promising as this, Adair. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I also really yeah. enjoyed Ramian's comment there. I have to shout out that. Uh, wonderful times. <laughs> um, yeah, currently Ramin. also I'm in this uh, Eli Lilly long, and Eli Lilly is, in a word, confused about what she would like to do with her life. Um, I got in. We're, like, really close to where I got in. I'm not getting out of this. I'd like to make it clear. And I got in because, like I said, this 588 level has been, like, 588, 587, 589. Lots of chop and churn, um, and we're not going any lower. So I'm interested if we see a decisive 588 break or anything like, you know, much below that, then I am Audi. For now, though, I'm going to probably give it to like that 587 ish, 587.50 area. Um, because, yeah, and I know I'm getting in long when we were da on the downside, but I mean, like this, we definitely, there's solid levels here. If I can take, you know, a couple bucks on that, if we can take it partially to VWAP. I am not going to complain. I would just like Eli Lilly to get her life right, figure out what she'd like to do, so I can figure out if this trade makes sense for me. Fantastic. All right, guys, let's uh, restart here. Uh, we have moving average envelopes and the four-week rule on deck for today's lessons. They are important because they're kind of continuing with the theme of the week, which is using moving average indicators for trades. Now, let's start uh, one more time here. Let me load up my notes and bring in my chart that has the envelopes on them. There we go. All right, Ram Ram. There we go. Ram Ram at msn.com. She put in the email there. That so is, she could, uh, I love the commitment herself. there. Uh, <laughs> I know, right? Uh, get herself. And the uh, MSN is just the, uh, the throwback. Fantastic, fantastic. I know. Once I haven't seen an MSN email in a while. Right, like the it's MSN minute, part is right? what killed me. <laughs> Instead of it's, the Chilean nightmare says better than putting AOL, right? Either, they're both. They're, it would both be great. Yeah. It would be great either. You've got mail. Oh yeah, yeah. I forgot about that. Um, all right, let, let's get started here. What is a moving average envelope? Okay. Well, moving averages in and of themselves are a popular trading tool. Unfortunately, they are prone to giving false signals in choppy markets. We talked about this ad nauseum this week. Moving averages are good for trending markets, not so good for consolidative markets. So how do we avoid um, you know, getting chopped up during consolidative markets while employing moving averages? Step in, moving average envelopes, okay? By applying an envelope to the moving average, some of these whipsaws, which whipsaws means basically false buy and sell signals, 
Many of these whipsaw trades can be avoided and traders can increase their profits. And that's the goal that we're all trying to achieve here. Envelope trading has been a favorite tool among technical analysts for years. And incorporating that technique with moving average makes for a useful combination. So let's understand a little bit about moving average envelopes. To limit the number of whipsaws, whipsaw trades, I should say, uh, some technicians proposed adding a filter to the moving average. Essentially what they did is they added lines that were a certain amount above and below the moving average to form an envelope. Trades would only be taken when prices moved through these filter lines, which were called envelopes because they enveloped the original moving average line. On the chart that you're looking at here, the peach line in the middle, that is the original moving average line, and the one I'm using here is a 20 EMA, and obviously above, that's the above enveloping line, and that's the below enveloping line. They are enveloping the middle one over here, okay? The strategy of placing the lines 5%, 5% above and below the moving average to form an envelope is illustrated as you see here. Now, there are three variables that you have when you are using this strategy. And I'm gonna show you what those are right here. So on my program, what I do is I have three different data points that I enter. One, am I going to use an exponential moving average or a simple moving average? That's choice number one. I've already explained I use exponential because I am an intraday trader and exponential moving averages more heavily weight the recent price action than the historical. That's first data point. Second data point, the period for the moving average. What period am I using? Seven, nine, 20, 50, 200? You gotta choose that one. And then third is the variance, the percentage above and below. So the enveloping lines, what percentage above and below the main moving average line are they going to be? In this case, the standard to use is 5%. These are not hard and fast rules. You can customize these to fit your own trading style most likely, you're going to have to do a trial and error system to see what works best for you, okay? So those are the three variables that we're talking about. In theory, moving average envelopes work by not showing the buy or sell signal until the trend is established. And it says in theory because there are obviously uh, fake outs. Analysts reasoned that requiring a close of 5% above the moving average before going long should prevent the rapid whipsaw trades that are prone to losses. So essentially what you're doing is you're waiting for the price for a long to get above this 20 moving average, which is the peach line over here, and then to move above 5% and break above before getting long. That's the kind of thing that they're looking for here. And that, so it is said, helps prevent these, uh, you know, fake outs, get it, whipsaws, whatever you want to call them, okay? The drawbacks of envelopes, and there are, in practice, what they did was raise the whipsaw line. So you ended up getting whipsawed anyway, except that it just, instead of getting whipsawed at the 20 EMA, you got whipsawed 5% whipsawed above the 20 EMA, which is the enveloping line. That's what ended up happening for some traders. As it turned out, there were just as many whipsaws, one study found, but they occurred at different price levels. Another drawback of this system is using envelope in this way is that it delays the entry on winning trades and gives back more profit on losing trades. And we talked about that. By virtue of placing the buy signal 5% above the moving average, you are leaving money on the table. In exactly the same way, you're going to leave money on the table on your entry and on your exit because you're gonna to have to wait longer to get out. Whereas if you got out initially on the break of the, the actual, the main moving average here, you're gonna to have to wait until the actually breaks the 5% lower enveloping line. And so that means leaving another 5% on the table at least, if not more. So there are issues obviously with the system. There are ways to make it work better though. The goal of using moving averages or moving average envelopes is to identify trend changes. And we talked about different ways we can identify a trend. The next topic will also help you with that. Often, the trends are large enough to offset the losses incurred by the whipsaw trades. And so even though you get wicked in and wicked out, like these false signals, 
the actual trades that you know manifest and assuming you allow them to run offset for the small losses that you make along the way. So it is said, okay? However, astute market observers noticed another use for envelopes. In the chart here, let me load it up. I had it earlier and I've got to load it up again. That ain't the one. One second, please. Da, 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 da. Where is it gone? There it is, where's gotcha. The chart chart? I gotcha, I know, where's the chart chart? Um, this is it over here. I'm just gotta load it, making it work better. There it is, all right, open image and new tab. This is the one over here. Let me just load up my notes again. That's not it. Sorry, guys. I hate to uh, delay the process over here. I just got to get things done properly. There we go. In the chart on the screen, we show the weekly chart of Starbucks with a 20-week moving average that envelops that and envelops set 20% and above below. So in this case, they're not using 5%, they're using 20%, and that's one of the variables that you change in your parameters. Most of the time, when prices touch the envelope lines, the price reverses, but there are some times when they continue trending, leading to losses. And so the whole point of this one is supposed to be to kind of know not to wait for the break of the enveloping lines, but to take trades off the enveloping lines as resistance and support. So it's a different way of using it. So what you're looking for here in exactly the opposite way that we explained before, which is when, like, look at this chart over here, oops, you're waiting for these lines to break like you would on Boeing over here after the double bottom, beautiful double bottom here on Boeing, oh, yeah. and then you would have gotten long through the break of the enveloping long right here on November 2nd, 2022, so about a year ago, you would have rode this bad boy quite nicely. That's one way to use it. The other way here is by having a bigger percentage difference between the main moving average line and the enveloping lines. So you'd increase it from five to 20. And what you would do in this case is you wouldn't wait for the enveloping lines to break. What you do is you would take long and short positions off them as a bounce. For example, look what happened here on Starbucks when we moved up in 2006 and touched the upper enveloping line we rejected off it, and in the same way, we bounced off it from the downside. So this is kind of like almost akin to Bollinger Bands, where you're getting basically the upper band as resistance and the lower band as support. Different ways to use this, depending upon what percentage variance you put between the developing lines and the main moving average line, okay? I hope that helps. So two ways to use this bad boy over here. One, as an area of support and resistance, and the other as a buy and sell signal through the break of the enveloping lines, okay? Yeah, I have a question. Go for so it. Does it matter which EMA you use? or it's gonna, Is it gonna be effective regardless of EMA? I think that's very important. No, I think no. it's very important. Okay. Your question is very appropriate. Um, I think that the longer term time frame requires a wider uh, or a longer dated. Oh, okay, that makes um, sense, like a 200. Exactly. Okay. The shorter term time frame, if you're gonna use this, if you're gonna try to employ this on the intraday, you want something shorter, seven, 10, nine, something okay. like that. You wanna swing trade, you're using 14 and above. Okay, and yeah. then the same with um, the time frame for charts is gonna depend on what time frame you're using it to trade for. Absolutely. Okay, awesome. Tip, yeah, that, I appreciate that, go, that. Bang on. There you go. So moving here, moving on down. So this is one, these are one of two ways. Again, to reiterate, one, you use the enveloping lines, the breach of the enveloping lines as buy or sell signals, and two, you expand the distance between the enveloping lines and the main moving average line and instead use it as support and resistance. So uh, I hope that helps. And um, now we are gonna talk a little bit about uh, the four week rule. Let, four week rule. Yeah, yeah, which doesn't require any charting, so we'll just leave this one up. Let's talk a little bit about how to employ this four week rule. Yeah, for sure. Um, I can go through that because okay, you, you went yes. through a lot. Oh, I appreciate time. that. Yeah. Thank you. Trading systems are usually thought of as complex computer programs requiring massive amounts of data to calculate the best entry and exit parameters. But in trading, often the best solution is simplest. Isn't that funny how that works? In fact, one of the best known trading strategies doesn't even require a computer. And that's what we're going to talk about now. We're, if you can count 
if you can count weeks and days, you can trade this one. <laughs> and I don't mean to be glib there, but that's the truth. The strategy for the four-week rule. Let's talk about this. The weekly rule, the four-week rule, in its simplest form, buys when prices reach a new four-week high and sells when prices reach a new four-week low. Sounds simple, right? Let's talk a little bit more about it. A new four-week high means that prices have exceeded the highest level they have reached over the past four weeks. Likewise, a four-week new low means prices are trading lower than they have at any time over the past four weeks. That should be simple. You get a chart, you look at the previous four weeks, what was the highest print, okay? And then you wait for a new high above that highest print to get long. Conversely, with lows, you're looking back four weeks to see what was the lowest four-week print, and then if you break that, you get short. Fair? Um, where was I here? This system is always in the market. You're either long or short, known simply as the four-week rule. This is the exact system designed by our main man, Richard Donkian, which we, donk. Donk. we talked about the Donkian chains yesterday in case you're wondering why we're giggling here. It's because he has a funny name. And uh, he's considered that we learned that during Donkian chain day, mm -hmm. he is considered the father of trend following. And then there's a whole other trend that he also apparently developed. So right. Go Richard. The good thing about this uh, trading system is you're always in the market. So some of these big money funds, not all, some of them, they cannot be in cash. Part of their mandate or part of their charter is they have to deploy the capital uh, that's given to them by their clients. So they have to be either long or short, but they have to be deployed in the market. This is one of the strategies that's employed by that big money. That's why it's important because it's an always in the market system. You're either long or you're either short based upon whether the equity or the equities that you're trading or the futures contract or the instrument is making new four-week highs or new four-week lows, okay? This strategy will consistently be on the right side of all big moves in a market. However, the strategy also has a low percentage of winning trades. The problem is that most market trends, uh, most markets trend about a third of the time. That's actually a data point I didn't know. That's interesting. Yeah. In some markets, the four-week rule may be right less than 40% of the time. The other trades are usually small losses, though, which occur while the market consolidates with choppy price action. So the theory, the theory here goes, despite the little paper cuts that you're taking, um, when the market is sideways consolidative, the money that you will make when the market is actually trending and you correctly employ this strategy should outweigh the paper cuts, the small losses that you make along the way, okay? Using the four-week rule, how do we employ this? As an example of the four-week rule, we can look at Google. Let me bring in that chart as well. Jeez, it's gonna take me a while as well. Goodness gracious. Uh, okay, this is before it was Google and Google, it, it was just one Google. Right? It was just one big Google. Four-week rule, here it is, using, there it is. Okay, open image, a new tab. Yeah, it was, they, they split. Um, one second. Yes. This strategy, uh, bah, 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 yes. We can look at the uh, Google before it split into two classes of shares in 2014. This chart over here shows a typical winning long trade. When a new four week high was reached, Google was bought. It was sold about 10 weeks later when it made a new four week low. So you bought over here when it made a new four-week high, and then you kept holding, you kept holding, you kept holding, you didn't sell until a new four-week low was made. So you bought at $525.78, and if you followed the rule exactly, you sold at $623.07, you made $100 in the money. However, there is an issue with this, and we're gonna talk about that. The trade resulted in an impressive 18% gain. Sure, $100 in the money. The problem with the trade, however, was that at its highest, over here, the trade was up by more than 30%, and you gave back nearly almost that whole thing by waiting for the sell signal. So how do you refine it? How do you refine this strategy so that you're, can, you're given a sell signal earlier 
and you lock in a bit more of those profits. Here's the strategy, ref the refinement. One way to address the problem of staying in a trade too long is to change the exit rule. Now we know the exit rule is you gotta wait for a new four week low. Instead of that, instead of following the original four week rule to exit a position, traders can exit when a moving average is broken. So you employ this strategy and then you weasel in a nice, <laughs> right? A moving average. For example, applying a 10 day moving average to the exit criteria on this chart means we would have got out when the trade was about 25% of the money, meaning we only gave up 5% off the top rather than giving up, what would we give up? We gave up 12% because we, we moved, we were up 30 and then we ended up making 18. By definition, that's a 12% give up. I'd rather give up 5% than 12 any day of the week. I don't know how you feel. A 10 day moving average was selected specifically for a reason, which was that it was one half of the actual trading days in a four week cycle. So we know that for four weeks, four actual calendar weeks, there are 20 trading days. So what this strategy employed is it said, okay, within four weeks there are 20 trading days, let's take the half of that, let's use the, the 10 moving average. And so that was the reason that was used there. There's also a trend filtering part to this. Another use for the four week rule is as a trend filter to the overall market. For many traders, it can be a challenge to determine whether the market is bullish or bearish on a short term basis, right? Long term, you can kind of look, you go on the weekly, you go on the daily, uh, most of the time you're either gonna see down into the right or up into the right. Very seldomly will you go on a, like, a 10 year view and will it be sideways? That is except if you're Walmart. Have a look at Walmart, yeah. If the market's most recent signal under the system is a buy, the trader can be confident that the market is in an uptrend. Downtrends can be defined as, at to, as times when the latest four week signal was a sell. In other words, the market has made a new four week low more recently than it made a new four week high. Using the four week rule as a filter, the trader would look at the four week rule to be on a buy signal before entering new long positions. Short sellers conversely would only be entered when the market is on a four week rule sell signal. I like this strategy. I think it's really interesting. I would prefer to use it for longer term yeah. swing trades personally. Swing trades can be up to like six months, maybe even more. Um, and I think that this probably would, uh, would entice me more than to try to apply it or try to make it fractal and use it intraday. Yeah, well, I know, because you were saying too, you could m maybe consider using it intraday if you're just looking kind of for general trends or if you're doing like four period. Like, I don't know how a four minute rule would work, but um, could, you know, could be interesting, right? Four minute, four 10 minute periods. I don't know. I mean, I, we'll have to wait and see. I like patterns. So if I can find a kind of a way mm -hmm. to make it work sure. um, intraday, you know, I will. And like I was saying earlier too, I think it would be interesting to apply this rule with some of the larger indexes, like the SPY, the NQ, because those, Absolutely. if we're trying to get a sense of market appetites, those are the big, those are the big boys. So Absolutely. I think that gives you kind of a better sense. Also, um, Blackberry tagging here with a question. Oh, yes. Um, going on here what is okay this person needs to get banned uh all right hide yeah omar bro you can't be dropping stuff like that you're just gonna get banned i'm not gonna waste my time with you um all right great question from blackberry yeah but wouldn't that moving average mean you were thrown out earlier for that four week rule example in october example i didn't have a look i don't know exactly what equity you're talking about i think it was the example from google well that was from like 2006 oh, okay though, never mind right yeah the moving average here would not be employed to get in, a, in the trade. You would have to wait for a four, uh, new four week high to be made before getting in the trade. But the or original rule said you had to wait for a new four week uh, low to be made before getting out. And so the only employing here of the moving average is on the exit, not on the entry. And so I don't think you'd necessarily be thrown out of it unless it really just like, you know, broke that 10 moving average and then pop back up again. In that case, you know what, you're out of luck. I, I see what you're saying. Um, it, it's never gonna be a perfect system. Uh, moving down. <laughs> yeah, bears versus bull. I That's enjoyed funny. that as well. Right, yeah. The little ninja. Anything you guys have to ask about uh, this type of system, put it in the chat for Adara and I. We've gone through it a few times now, Adara, uh, you know, very succinctly put, um, 
uh, summarize that. I hope I was able to uh, surmise it as well as her on this last occasion. It's a strategy. These are two strategies that I don't employ daily, but you know, I have more of an affinity for the four week rule affinity. than I have for the moving averages yeah. uh, envelopes, to be quite honest with you. I do like the four week rule. I think it's an excellent swing trade um, um, system that you can follow. And especially if you employ it with the moving average exit, I think uh, you can be successful. But yeah. like everything else, Adara, Try it in the sim or back test it before you ever use real money on the line. And if you are new, you should not be using real money whatsoever until you can prove profitability in the sim. If you can't make money in the sim, you probably can't make money in real life when it gets harder and you have to deal with the psychological issues that come with L's. And the, the L's will be there, I promise you. Oh, yeah. And yeah. I think well, some, this is kind of a conversation that was happening in the chat. I think maybe last week as well and earlier this week, basically saying that when you're in the sim, you don't have as much on the line. And I would say that's true to an extent. And I'm coming from someone who is like, mm -hmm. you know, I've, I talk about it quite a lot. I am. Fair. I'm in the sim. Um, I find... And, you know, I, I think it's just because I, you know, I like to take things seriously. I still, you know, try to use, I try to employ the same kind of, um, you know, discipline and, um, you know, hopefully like emotional control. And I, I, I like Absolutely. to, you know, take it just as hard if there is a loss in the sim. And I know, you know, that could seem like, oh, but you're going to take loss in the real world too. I recognize that, right? And I mean, like, I think part of that is recognizing that you have to take L's in order, you know, to, to make wins. And I use this quote way too much. Shout out to 21 Savage. <laughs> I'm making less L's, taking more M's. Or taking less L's, making more M's. There we go. <laughs> but that's always the goal. That's going to be my goal in the sim. And that's also going to be the goal, um, Hope you know, if going live happens at one point. Another thing, too, I want to mention as well is I think um, part of this with regards to trading is, like, you know, knowing your system, knowing what works for you, knowing what your limitations are, um, and then, you know what I mean? If like trying to get past those limitations, I know for myself, my big thing is getting rid of my winners way too early, panicking. Um, and then when I, same with losses, the second things going a little bit awry, I would run for the hills. So now I think what I've kind of tried to do to combat that is to set more um, solid kind of, you know, parameters for risk. And when you, and I like also, I think, you know, with this week and last week as well, trying to math out my risk parameters, kind of knowing like, oh, like this is, you know, kind of mathematically the last time we had this jump, especially someone who likes to train at ranges. Do you know what I mean? That's kind of um, that's kind of my take on that. And yeah, I recognize not everyone is, like I, I agree the emotional element isn't exactly the same. For myself though, I like to take it just as seriously and kind of figure it out that way. Okay, Adira, you ready? We're gonna do a little quiz thing right now. I'll try. <laughs> No, but I think it would really help the audience. Yeah, uh, no, the viewers, I agree, right? I agree. And obviously it's no comment on Adara, who is doing fantastic, by the way, because uh, I see her day in and day out, not only her understanding of the overall market, but her, her uh, trading abilities, by the way. Uh, so shout out to Adara. Before we uh, go on to that, I just have a couple of quick questions I want to ask. Jakob says, I enjoy the new format a lot. Thank you for the information and effort you two put into teaching. Much appreciated. No, we're thankful for that you're joining us, my friend. And thank you for the kind words, Jakob. Fee f rhymes with AMC. So is it sell at four-week high, buy at four-week high? What? Or is it buy at four-week okay. So you're waiting for a new four-week high to be made before buying. So you're gonna go back four previous weeks or start from today and then wait for a four week high. If no one comes, then you don't, you don't get in, okay? Or you can go in and go back four weeks, base it off that high and then once a new high is made, you enter there. And then your exit using the old system would be on the making of a four week low. You could kind of alleviate some of the profits that you would give up for, by waiting for that four week low by using a moving average, typically 10 days, a 10 day SMA, and get out through the break of that. Okay, hope that helps. Any other questions? Moving down, moving down. Eric, next week we need a training on how to receive alerts when two or more indicators confluence are showing an opportunity, thanks. Thank you for the suggestion, Eric. I think that that is an absolutely great suggestion. Uh, next week, however, we will be talking about the psychology of trading. And if you wanna jump in uh, and get ahead of the matter, the book that I would suggest you use is Trading in the S uh, J Zone by, um, what's his name? Uh, Mark Douglas. Uh, it's fantastic. It's kind of the, the Bible of uh, the psychology of trading. I've read it a couple of times. I know that 
you know, multiple traders will read it once a year to help really internalize it. Um, that's what we will be talking about next week. Jay Lee, Jay, are you averaging in UNG at 550? I've been averaging into super, I'm out. You know that. I, 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 I don't know if you were here the other day, Jay, but I'm out. Um, yeah, it's, it's a trade, it's not an investment, so I had to draw the line somewhere. So if it starts trending back up though, I might re, uh, I might re look at that one. Okay, ready? Yeah. Okay. The eyebrows. <laughs> yeah, no, I'm not. I'm not here to to fool you or to. No, try I understand. To... The eyebrows would tell another story. Right? But... Okay. Yeah, I know. I know. You're I kind of like... put you off a little bit there. I'm no, sorry. No, it's okay. It's funny. It's funny. Um, let me load up the notes over here. Okay, Adara. Um, the four, the, not the four week rule. The moving average envelope. Okay. Tell me the three variables that you need to input into your system to, uh, to appropriately um, set the four-week envelope. So there are three data points that I had to enter into okay. my system here. So your moving average? Yes. So the moving average, tell me about the moving average. There, it's a moving average. Go so ahead. yeah, um, if you're going to do shorter term, it's better to use the EMA, or in general the EMA, because it's more receptive to right. more recent price action. So uh, clarify. So pr your, your answer is right. So in this case, you chose EMA over SMA as the first variable, That's correct? That's the first variable, yeah. Okay, second variable. So it's um, it's time frame. Okay, right? fantastic. Time frame, yeah. Right? And then and we'll explain what you mean. Okay, so like if days. you want to have like like yeah. what days, right? So if you're going to yeah. do um, day trading, you might want a tighter time frame. If we're talking longer term investments or swings, you might want to push that out a little bit farther. Same with the the moving averages, right? Like the amount of days you have your moving averages is also very much going to vary depending on your time frame okay. in which you are trading. So that's two variables. The third. It's the percentage, right, for that above and below, and they say about five percent. Is <laughs> the bank button's, ma button's making a comeback? You know it, baby. That you know it. <laughs> but yeah, that is my that is my take. Amazing. And JB, you got it as well. Shout out to you, my man. Uh, I love quiz time. I saw that, that too. Rhymes with MC. Uh, you guys are bang on. That is exactly it right there. Uh, you are just to re uh, recap. You, she said it very appropriately. You're going to choose one exponential moving average or simple moving average. That's your first variable. The number two, you're gonna choose the actual moving average that you wanna use. Is it the 20 period, the 50 period, the 200 period? What are you gonna use, okay? And the longer the moving average, the wider or the higher time frame you should be trading on. So for example, if you're using the 50, you're trading on the hourly. In this case, it's not gonna be an intraday trade. It will likely be a swing. The third variable is the percentage of the enveloping lines. Are they 20% above or are they 5%? 20%. Now that makes a difference. If you are going to use it as a support and resistance indicator, by buying off the bottom enveloping line and selling off the top one, you are using 20%. If you are looking for the breakout or a technique to you uh, of using these in, uh, the moving average envelope, you are doing it at 5%. So to, re to recap, I wanna bring in the chart over here so that I can kind of explain what I mean. This one here is 5%. So this is the 20 period EMA, this peach line, and the above and below lines are 5% away from the 20 EMA. In this particular case, I am using it as a breakout, meaning that when the price breaks above, the above enveloping line, that's when it's along. And when it breaks below, that's when I'm getting out. That's not the only way to use it. The other way to use it is to use it like this. This is 20%. So this over here is the main moving average and then the enveloping lines are separated by 20%. In this particular case, I'm not looking for a breakout trade, rather I'm taking a support or resistance. I buy on the touch of the lower enveloping line and I sell or short on the touch of the upper enveloping line. I hope that helps, okay? Sharif photoshopped Rambo's arms from the 80s on the video picture. Hmm? I don't know about that. <laughs> Shout out to Rambo, though, man. One of my favorite actors ever, obviously. So Why? Go ahead. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Okay. Which is what I typically do, right? Um, 
Uh, thank you, Pretty Panda. That's nice that you say. All right. <laughs> All right. Next, uh, next question now for you, Adara. Okay. Hold on. Is it Adara or it's Adara? It's like mascara. It's Adara. It's Adara. Yeah, you're saying it wrong, Ram Ram. I mean, people right say over. it differently, honestly. Like, <laughs> I know I, I've heard two people, like, in Toronto apparently have a hard time saying it Adara. I don't know if that's a Toronto-specific thing. But, yeah, like, I've had people be like, we cannot say it that way. I don't know. But, yeah. Okay. Is that it right there? Okay, guys, for the giveaway for uh, the, uh, the shirts from our guest, uh, people were trying to put their emails in the chat and it didn't work. So Bears vs. Bulls has posted uh, a, a link right there. It says, please register for the giveaway from Todd and Red Light, and he put in a link there, okay? So click that link, fill out the form, and I'm going to post it as well. I'm going to copy and paste it it's right pin now. comment too, yeah. It's the, say that again, Raymond? Pin comment? Click pin comment. Pin. Okay, so the, the comment at the top, let me bring it in. This is the chat right here. If you click the top over here, you click that, and then bang, you get, uh, yeah, there you go, okay? So then you put in your well, email there. Cool. So for uh, for those who were looking for the uh, the giveaway, come uh, for the giveaway, guys, click that link or click, Hey. By the way, as soon as 15 people sign up, it's going to be it's going to be away. So it's, the, it's only the first 15. Thanks for that, guys. Wanted to. Uh, Thank you. No, no problem. Thank you. Thank you. Um, did it says with love to all. That's a nice That's name. That's such a nice, happy name. Yeah. Okay. Adira, what are some of the drawbacks of envelopes? Okay. Well, they can be tricky in choppy markets. Um, and they still don't completely get rid of the whipsaw effect. Um, that is one element about that. Also, you can, um, with a lot of these indicators like this, because they're lagging, you can actually not make all the profits you want to make, and then you can hold on to losses a little bit longer. So you do risk, you know, um, taking more L's and making less L's. Okay. <laughs> um, you have to throw that in there. I, I well, it. I like, I flipped it and reversed yeah, it, right? It's but fantastic. yeah. Fantastic. Um, so that is, that is my take on the EMA, or yeah, the, yeah, sorry, the enveloping um, moving averages Fair. and why they're not 100%. Fantastic. Okay. Time's up. Is it, it's, it's all like over, guys? <laughs> um, okay, let and me send it to you for a bit. And the fact that the comes after that as well. Um, yeah, I'm enjoying this. Also, um, with love to all here in the chat with my name, I wish happiness for everyone. That's very nice. Um, yeah, lots of um, enjoying this in the chat here. Great times. Um, yeah, so I think, I think I've learned a lot too with these enveloping moving averages. But like with all indicators, you might want to use it with a couple other indicators to switch it up. Absolutely. Okay, I'm going to do a couple of more and then I got to go up to the big desk okay. cover for Brendo. Yeah, for sure. And so you're going to you're going to be signing off. On okay, awesome. Today. Yeah, um, let's do all it. All right. Four week rule. Surmise. Surmise. The four week rule for me. Is the four week rule is the idea that you're looking at a little stock, you're trying to see the movement, and then let's say you look at like from from a certain point you see the stock break the four week high. That's when you buy. That's okay. when you get in the stock. Right. Then you're in it for X amount of time. You're waiting. You're watching. You're keeping an eye. You're charting. What's really cool about the four-week rule that rhymed um, is that you actually do not need any fancy math in. You don't need any algo. Yes. All you need is to look at the chart. So you're in the stock. It's trucking along. It's going well. And then you see it breaks a four-week low. What do you do? You get out. That's the four-week rule. Now, the one okay. issue with the four-week rule is you... Essentially, you're waiting for a new four-week low to break before you get out, right? So then some people will switch it. They'll make their out based on um, a two-week, which is 10 days, because in the trading world, you have um, 20 days in a month mm -mm. because we don't trade on weekends. i got to correct you right there. Oh. You're, you're bang on. Um, your exit is going to be based on a moving average. Oh, right. Okay. Right? Thank okay. you. So you're, you're, everything you said was correct, but the, the last part is you need to wait if you want to employ a strategy to help prevent leaving a lot of money on the table, you don't wait for the four week low, you get, you use a moving average like the 10 day. Okay. And you wait for a breach of the 10 day once it comes off that four week high. Right, okay, that okay? makes sense. So that is, yeah, so you're bang on there. What other, um, what other use can be uh, employed by the four week rule? Uh, so it's to look for trends. And so how you do that 
is you're kind of seeing like generally what's what's trending within the four weeks, right? So you kind of use that to gauge your entry points and your exits. You can get a sense of where and how the markets are trending based on like, oh, did we break a new four week high? Did yes. we break a four week low? Yes. That's how you gauge your um, ins and your outs. Now, one of the drawbacks for this particular low rule is that it is a longer term rule. Absolutely. Um, so if you're doing short term trading, you might want to be a little bit more skeptical. You were saying you could even use it fractally as a four period, for example. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, four. I've never minutes, employed for example. it for that, though. Yeah. You're going to have to back test Sorry, that yeah, ability. That, yeah. That's fair, too. Yeah. But um, so thank you for uh, no clarifying that. Yeah. But yeah, no, I think um, I was saying too, I think this one could be really interesting if you try to use it on the SPY or the NASDAQ or something like that, because then you're getting a better sense of overall market trends. Right. Okay. So yeah, interesting times indeed. All right, and guys, four -week we will be concluding our moving average indicator talk tomorrow. Make sure to check out Adira and I, um, same obviously time, 11 o'clock. Uh, we'll, we'll let you know exactly what we're doing tomorrow. Make sure kind of to review all the stuff that we've been talking about. Maybe we'll be able to put something out there like note wise. I know that I've made notes and I don't have a problem sharing them yeah, with I've you guys. Yeah, I've made notes as well. Yeah, um, we'll, we'll see about that. Maybe the production team can put it up. All right, I'm gonna have to sign off. I'm gonna send it to you. Adair will be taking you through the end there. I'm gonna go up to the big desk and get ready to Bruno. Sign our guys. Au revoir. Adios. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I will. Um, you want me to put this in? Let's talk about. Um, I can talk about my Eli Lilly trade. We got out of this. Um, Super SPAC man was chatting with me in the chat about this. Uh, I said chat too many times there. Uh, basically, like, oh, is your out? Because I got in at 588.60. Did I? Yes, I did. Got in at 588.60. And so Super SPAC man was like, are you getting out if it breaks 487? And yeah, that was my goal. We touched 487, we bounced off of it beautifully. Um, and then we flew back to the downside. So why did I get in here? Good question, no, I'm joking. Um, I did have a reason at the time. In retrospect, probably should not have gotten in where I did. But yeah, I liked this chop and churn that we had around 587 earlier before flying to the upside. Then we came back down. If I was gonna get in this long, I probably should have gotten in right at 587. That was the first mistake. Um, and then we kind of, yeah, we fell off a little bit. Mark Wagner saying in the chat here, I sold um, Lily at 580.50 or 588.50. Sorry, yeah, that sounds like a very solid place for it to do to do that. Um, but yeah, so I'm just kind of looking at this one here. Yeah, we did fall off a little bit. Um, I had that nice Eli Lily short here earlier, so no complaints. You win some, you lose some, and I'm you know I'm just trying to learn kind of for trades, right? So when I look at this trade, obviously I think the biggest issue was getting in where I did should have gotten in earlier, and I can learn from that now. Um, Eric Lanouville, go take, sorry if I butchered your last name there, I'm so sorry. Go take care of Tesla. Good afternoon. Yeah, let's look at, let's look at Tesla. I have not seen um, my frenemy, Besla, Stressla, Mesla. I think we might be a Mesla this afternoon. But yeah, look at, look at Tesla. This is a hard one to kind of decipher. So Sharif and I were having this conversation because I was saying earlier, I was like, is this a head and shoulders on Tesla? And Sharif was like, well, it would be more of a head and shoulders if Tesla was up on the day, but head and shoulders is a reversal pattern. And yeah, true to form, we didn't really do much here. We, we had a little baby swoop further down to the downside. 240 was holding as a bottom for Tesla <laughs> for a while there. Um, and then yeah, 240 still kind of holding. The two, now we're at this 239 area. Tesla's taking a nice little fall to the downside. Nothing I would like to get involved in at this point because as we know, I like clear ranges and I like kind of areas of opportunity. Not seeing much going on here with Tesla, but we know what I'm excited for in just around an hour. Literally, I've had it up all day. I am not kidding. I got up here, I put it on, not taking it off. Time for um, Tesla soon. Usually I don't trade after the midday. The midday is pretty much when I trade. Um, I might keep an eye on Tesla maybe, but yeah, I think I am probably do not have the experience to trade something as volatile as a Tesla cyber truck event. You know, we're gonna be honest with ourselves here. Um, let me see uh, some mentions of Boeing here in the chat. Let's look at Boeing. Um, oh, Boeing is gorgeous. Sorry for the, the giant yell there. I was just very, I was loving this. Like this is, you know, we were talking about upward channels yesterday, last week. Uh, yes, or last week. Um, yeah, upward channel. And then we kind of flew like one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, like almost an hour worth of channels um, of like green candles to the upside here. Yeah, Boeing had a great day. Shout out to a Peter Sun in the chat. I would agree. And Boeing's had lots of positive news catalysts lately too. Killed the Dubai Air Show. Upgrade after upgrade after upgrade. Someone gave them a price target of 275. 
Um, let me find if there's any more recent info on Boeing. Oh, oh, okay, there is, there is. Okay, the government of Canada signed a foreign military sales letter of offer and acceptance for up to 16 Boeing P-8A Poseidon aircrafts. Delivery is expected by 2026. So congrats to Boeing and congrats if you are in this Boeing long, because this is just, this is chef's kiss. This is beautiful. Um, like we went from, at the point of open, we went from 225 to 231. This Boeing long is gorgeous. Yeah, Northwestern Canopy Development by the rumor sell the news. I agree, except what makes me curious about Tesla here is that it's kind of doing the opposite. Tesla is sort of selling the rumor. Maybe it'll buy the news. I don't know. Like I said, my biggest issue, um, my biggest um, point of confusion here with Tesla and what makes me nervous is the MetaConnect drama. I got swept up at MetaConnect. If you guys saw this on the midday, it happened live. We lost three paper trade dollars per share in the MetaConnect event. And um, so, I mean, we're trying to learn from that, but I mean, like, I'm trying to trade everything, right? Like, I traded the Birkenstock IPO, although that, you know, did not necessarily work perfectly. So I'm just trying to, like, see what I can learn from. I may take a look. Oh, shout out to Fee Rhymes with AMC in the chat. Are you going to wrestle with Tesla? I may. I may. Um, we'll see if it, it's a Stressla or Bessla in the end. Um, yeah, uh, with love to all, midday is great for slow trading, up and down, very predictable scalping. I agree that I think that's why I scalp a lot in the midday. Like we had some nice um, Eli Lilly scalp. Well, we had one nice Eli Lilly scalp earlier. But yeah, just um, trying to kind of learn and grow here with all of you. And I really hope everyone's kind of enjoying the lessons that we have been imparting um, so far. Also, I'm going to check on Meta briefly before I pass it back to the, the front there. Um, uh, Black Bear, I did not trade the art on my PO, I traded Birkenstock. Meta has been so flat from like two, four, 323 to 324. Meta is just that channel. There was a nice short here earlier that I let go of far too early. But yeah, Meta very much in a channel. Um, lots kind of in a channel here. Um, oh, Nvidia kind of popping up off of a baby double bottom on the five minute here. Um, are you guys good to go over there? Fabulous. Okay, well, thank you so much for spending some time over here with us at the midday. We're going to do more lessons tomorrow. Same bad time, same bad channel. Right now, Sharif, the professor at the Big Desk. Thank you very much, Adara. Yeah, covering for Brendo today as he takes care of some business. Let's look how the market is doing after having a great November 